Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We have a great panel here today. Thank you for tuning in. We have a lot of things to talk about, and I think you guys will really find a lot of value out of this. So uh, here we have we have Gibby, we have Gail, Taps Trades, Crypto Chris, uh, Comics and Crypto, Hello K. This is all organized by Gibby, well known for the Christmas Vive hashtag there. It was very successful, very great. So uh, Gibby, thanks for organizing this. Yeah, this is more of, I'm, I'm happy that everyone's just kind of here. Uh, hoping that we can add some insight for the community and stuff, but thanks everyone for being here. So, so maybe we can start with some introductions. Uh, let's start with just the Gale, and then we'll just kind of go around and uh, introduce each other. Tell, tell us what you do, what, you know, as it relates to Vivi. So they call me the Gale. I started my channel in March. I'm a master collector in training. Basically, I'm on BBF collecting. I have some OMI as well, and I've been basically doing OMI ever since I started in March. So, yeah. Is that it? <laughs> hey, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, my name is Sean. I'm, I'm with a podcast called Comics and Crypto. I'm a co-host uh, with Spencer and Kevin. Big shout out to Spencer and Kevin. We focus a lot on comics, but also collectibles on the movie marketplace, but also talk about uh, comic books as well. And uh, yeah, really happy to be here. What's up, guys? My name's Chris. I uh, started making Ecomi and VV videos early March. I like really breaking down things because when I was first getting into crypto, uh, things weren't broken down in the way that I would like. So that's kind of my focus is going over the basics. Made my first How to Buy Omi video, I think, March 3rd. Uh, I live stream early drops like DeLorean drop. And uh, yeah, I've been making like different VV and Ecomi related videos ever since. Hey, everyone. Taps Trades here. Uh, Omi, VV, sorted crypto and NFT content creators since also March. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Gibby. Can't wait to get into some of this. Uh, is it just myself left? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, yeah, so I'm Kay. Um, people know me by Hello Kay on my YouTube channel. I got into uh, Ecomi kind of late February, but I didn't really jump into VV until March as well, uh, which is around the time I started uploading videos. Uh, I'm a software engineer by trade. And yeah, um, that's a pretty much the overall summary. Um, and uh, apparently I have a lot of DeLoreans. <laughs> My name is Daniel. I have a YouTube channel here. I got into uh, VB in April, late April, and uh, it's been quite a ride ever since. Yeah, and I'm Gibby. Uh, I'm Gibby on VB on Twitter. I don't really have a YouTube channel, but maybe these guys can one day convince me and give me some tips on how I can make my own channel, but maybe one day. <laughs> So, so basically what we'll be doing here today, guys, is uh, we want to try to help educate a lot of the, we noticed that a lot of new users are jumping into VV nowadays. The community is growing quite rapidly and there's a lot of information that we used to share back in the day that we kind of have moved on since because it's been so long and there's always new stuff happening. So today's combo will just basically be trying to help out the new users navigate, sharing our resources, sharing some tips and stuff like that. And um, if you guys are comfortable, we can kind of get started. Let's go. Awesome. So the first question that uh, I did want to cover will be covered by TAPS. And it's just basically, we're going to be talking about the market analysis, um, stuff like what's your current uh, take on the VV market and where do you see it going in 2022? And TAPS will share some of his resources as well. Perfect. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So, and thanks for the intro. So basically I was going to just real quick touch on the broader crypto NFT market, like what it looks like going into 2022, because at the end of the day, like OMI is an altcoin and what happens in the crypto NFT market affects everything. So touch on that real quick and then go into the actual VV market using one of the tools that I think we'll also touch on later today as well and how things are kind of trending going into 2022. So let me share my screen here. Boom. So let me, all right, everyone can see it, right? Yep. 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 Awesome. So just kind of overall market, and I know there's a lot of people who are new to Ecomi, sometimes newer to the crypto space. You know, a lot of people's first crypto was actually OMI. But looking at 2022, right now where we're, we've been at, Bitcoin, altcoins, everything's been down all-time highs. We've actually been in a 
pretty uh, a, a big consolidation aside from Bitcoin, which is reflected through all coins as well. But going into 2022, historically, a majority of the time in January, Bitcoin actually has been positive slightly and has actually traded pretty, pretty like in line and just kind of stayed around like a mid base size, which whenever Bitcoin just trades sideways for a long period of time, we usually see altcoins actually shoot up in price. And January actually typically is a big, big month for Ethereum, which we're about to be an Ethereum layer two solution on Immutable X. So I think we're going to start to see more of a coupling with OMI tied to Ethereum as well and the collectibles because we'll be able to spend Ethereum eventually when we're in the Mutable X marketplace. So as a whole, January and even Q1 sometimes is just really, really strong for altcoins. And that will hopefully reflect with a lot of the catalysts that are going to happen with OMI and also our collectibles as well. And as we can see this year, we've seen smart contracts kind of trade you know, or start to go up in volume. But Web3 and NFTs is where we've seen some huge, huge moves. And we had that big consolidation on NFTs in June of January, which is actually when we saw the cheapest that you could have ever gotten your VV collectibles was right in that dead of summer. And that's when some of the biggest moves were made. So a lot of time people are saying, hey, VV collectibles aren't NFTs or, you know, they're not NFTs yet. But what's funny is when you look at OpenSea metrics and then compare them to our metrics in the VV marketplace, they are very, very similar with what's happened in the markets overall. So now that we're going to be on Immutable X and actually in other marketplaces like OpenSea, eventually, uh, sorry, eventually OpenSea, Immutable X marketplace, hopefully Binance NFT marketplace and Coinbase marketplace eventually, we're going to see that translate even further. Now, onto the VV marketplace. When we've seen this month, the collectibles have gone up in value quite a bit. And I'm using a Comey Wiki, which I think we'll touch on some of the tools that you can use as a group. Um, if you're not using a Comey Wiki, I use it pretty much every single day at this point. But we can see like most of the collectibles are kind of going up or have had a big increase this month. And there's been some consolidation on some as well, but specifically on the blue chips. And even on the comics, the comics are starting to gain quite a bit and seeing a lot more value. They were in a slump for quite some time. But one thing that you want to pay attention to is really um, what's happening in the market. So if you're if you're a swing trader, if you're a flipper, you want to look at when things are at like a really high. And again, not financial advice, never financial advice from all of us. Um, but I use this as a pretty strong metric to see what is trending at a really, really high, choose to sell it at a high and then wait for some catalysts that are going to cause it to go lower. And so when we look at some of the blue chips, like, let's see, where's, oh, I'm on the comics, aren't I? When we look at some of the blue chips, like the amazing Spider-Man, where is he? Boom, ultimate animated. I use this as a metric to kind of see, okay, what is happening? What happened this month to see actual prices go up? So when I hop out, you can see this is probably one of the most consistent upwards gainers. But what happened here? You can see it jumped up from 17,900 17, all the way up to 24,900. And that was right around December 14th. Well, there's two things that happened right here. And that was that we had Immutable X, of course, remint all of our NFTs. But also, this was something that I touched on in a video a while back, was that we could see a big price boom because of the delistings. And we can see that's reflected. Right. We saw a big delisting in a bunch of collectibles, including the blue chips that happened right here. We see the price vertical jumped up here with some consolidation from, of course, not being able to put them in a mutable X marketplace and also people taking profit because what do you do is you you buy low and sell high. So this is something that's kind of reflected in the market as a whole that I've seen. We're seeing this with uh, the animated Spider-Man. We're seeing that with the Risos. We're seeing that with the Todd's. We're seeing it across the board. But. I would, I would air some caution as there are some other collectibles that if you're using things like this, like if I look at the pride, which I think long-term is going to be something that will do really, really well, but careful with how you're trading in the marketplace. Because when you look at some of the metrics too, when you have a big jump just unnaturally and you can see more sp sporadically uh, sold, it, it almost is a, a term or it's almost a look of manipulation. So there are some collectibles that you need to weigh out. Is it being manipulated from some whales versus is it naturally going up? Kind of like how the animated Spider-Man is up, just 
consistently selling at higher at higher highs. So that's kind of a look at the overall marketplace is our collectibles are up, our comics are up and going into 2022 with the ad of Immutable X, there's, there's just going to be more uh, attention on our collectibles because they're going to be truly realized as true NFTs. So I, I would say this is the best time to make some of your strategic buys and sells going into 2022. That's awesome. Um, Taps, do you think that when it comes to um, the, well, I, I guess a lot of people say that we enter like the bear market. Do you think that affects the prices on VV as well? Do you see there is, is there a connection there? Yeah. So, I mean, there will of course be, you know, whether in 2022, there's a lot of talk around poten uh, potentially being like a financial crisis with tapering of inflation, all that coming potentially in Q2 or the end of Q2 next year. If that does happen, people will naturally take profit, especially with MTL coming um, because you have to pay your bills, right? Like people will get wrecked in stocks and in real estate and other financial markets. So you're going to take money where you have money, right? And so that will be reflected initially in the collectibles, but I don't think it will be as severe because when you look at NFTs and the collectible market as a whole, you look at people who are truly investors, right? Like the collectible market even when, when there was a huge dip in uh, you know, 2018 and then again in 2020, if you had purchased comics or you know, some of the, the really well-known collectibles back then, even in those markets, yeah, they went down, but they're way, way higher today, right? So if you just held out for three years or even two years, you're way up on your investment. So there, there will probably be an initial you know, strong dip, but collectibles and collectibles and they're just strong investments and a great store of wealth long-term. Awesome. And we actually got the other guy who was going to do our market analysis. Welcome to the stream, Andy. Can you uh, introduce yourself as well, Andy? I think a lot of us have. Andy, you're on mute. Mute. Fuck. <laughs> hey, bud. Yeah, Andy. I'm, I'm on now. <laughs> Yeah, you're all good. Sorry, you're all good. <laughs> Sorry guys. Um, I'm just back from my game, but hi everyone. My name is Andy. Uh, I'm a Scottish content creator who focuses a lot more on market analysis when it comes to VV and also helping you grow your knowledge. It's great to meet all of you. I know I've not talked to some of you personally, but it's really, really great to see some of you. Awesome. So Andy, I hate to kind of put you on the spot, but uh, me and Taps were kind of discussing a little bit more of the market analysis. And I think you're kind of our expert on the market analysis so what do you think of the vv's current uh market it's actually really interesting right now you know there's a lot of fluctuations happening because i think people are in this sort of limbo where they don't know when mtl is coming they don't know if there's going to be something big coming into the new year so it seems like there's sort of the half and half mix of people selling off to make sure they have gems ready and people sort of saving everything because there might be some massive news to make sure to keep everything so it's it's weird that i've seen it sort of down 50 50 split where some things are actually taking quite a good rise whilst others are taking a significant fall. You know, I thought something like Deadpool after 12 days would have sort of shot up. But I think because of the things like Disney, a lot of it started to sort of dwindle away. People started to focus more on the grails, which I'm really excited about because now it shows us that people are getting smarter. You know, we're understanding maybe what's going to hold that long-term value. Maybe not worthwhile holding just right now until maybe some things in the VV version utility are there. So I'm actually really liking to see that a lot of people are selling off maybe some of the things that aren't going to be classed as quote unquote grails, but are looking to things to sell off to then get those for the five, six year and seven year long holds. Um, and that's what I've sort of found in the last few days anyway, after 12 days was finished and we're, we're leading up to the new year. So before we move on, this is kind of an open one for anyone here. Um, do you guys think that this will always happen when we have these big things uh, being announced, do you always, do you think that we'll always have these gem fluctuations or these gem squeezes, or do you think that that eventually tethers off and we won't have much more of that happening? Anyone can answer this question. The Gail, I don't know if you want to take on this one. Uh, so yeah, you're asking if there if there's always going to be gem squeezes. Yeah, if you if like maybe in the future when a lot bigger things are going to happen, do you still see it always happening from this point on? Uh, that's a that's a good point because um you know we don't have mtl yet and we don't have like crypto to omi or crypto to gems yet so when we have you know more options to throw money in i'm not sure if people are going to be uh selling their collectibles as easily like they'll be able to dump money in if they have it on the side like that so 
it just depends on how VB, how often VB has drops, what they dis, what they drop in the future, um, how often they drop it. So it's hard to say, really. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, I did notice that you guys were mentioning MTL. So with that, let's uh, kind of move to that subject, and I'll pass it over to Daniel and Kay. Um, for you guys, do you guys want to kind of touch on why MTL might be taking so long? Um, kind of what we should expect when it comes, and uh, yeah. Daniel can what? add on. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so MTL. Um, I've actually spoken to some MTL providers as well for another project I'm working on. So um, typically, they have to, they don't create the MTL themselves, as many guy people know. They have to integrate with an existing provider that has all of the um, kind of legal compliance side, you know, handled for them. They're like a vendor for VV. And that's essentially what VV's had to do. Um, but before they can do that, they need to go through, you know, several stages of, you know, basically legal red tape. And that's what took them the long, like the really long amount of time is getting through those uh, kind of legal red tape and things um, until it's like properly finalized. Even when it's finalized, there's always changes to regulation. So then that, I believe, is what's held them up for so long. The actual integration, uh, the development side. I don't believe it takes anywhere near as long as the actual, you know, the the, the legal side of things. So um, there's been a lot of changes to regulations, and I think they just want to make sure that they get it right. Just because, you know, I know the team; they've kind of been always been thinking like twenty steps ahead. So that is one area. The other area is, I believe, they there is that development aspect, and they've been held up on their development um, roadmap because of multiple different, you know, things that have popped up, you know, they've been com actively combating the bots, even though some people think they haven't. Um, they've been, you know, kind of resolving random glitches in the app, like people who get reverse clock gated, um, like myself, or, you know, many other people on the last drop, last, last drop, I think. Um, and, you know, there's, there's like a lot of optimization going on, a lot of other features. So um, it just comes down to, you know, prior priority. And I think MTO is a priority for them. It's just, you um, they want to make sure that it's executed in a way where everything has been super thoroughly tested because it's fine if they get like a, you know, a, a visual bug or something that, you know, displays things incorrectly, like whatever, that's not end of the world. But if there's money involved and assets involved and something goes wrong in that pipeline, that is going to cause a lot of issues legally for VV, but then also a lot of issues for um, Lucas, who does like the support for VV, because, you know, when where was that glitch with the uh, gems and people sending transactions and losing gems? Um, they were they were absolutely flooded with like, you know, support tickets and it just basically jammed up the whole network. And then people who were blocked, you know, because of the VV anti-bot system or whatever it is, their tickets got kind of back pushed back and there were people for like you know six weeks that were waiting for their accounts to get unlocked and that was because i believe it's because of you know that flood of random uh, support tickets related to you know people having you know messed up gem transactions and whatnot so i think yeah it's just um i would say the overall takeaway is it's just how business works you know you, you can't plan for everything yeah i think it's it's quite an interesting subject um i'm learning more about mtl kind of every day and the more research I do on it, the more you kind of learn how uh, it's a very big process and it's it's important that it's done correctly. Um, so um, Daniel, Chris, maybe you guys can touch on this, but do you guys think that the market will take maybe a slight hit when MTL comes out? And uh, what do you think will happen once MTL is finally released? <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to see because I think the general consensus is that when MTL is initially announced, released for everyone, most likely, and I think a lot of people would would agree with this. Most likely, a lot of the prices of the collectibles will go down in price as people start selling it off to capture those gems to get finally get cash, right? Because it's been months before, you know, since since this all started. But I think long term, if you look at it from a long term perspective, you'll also see a lot of money come into the app. I mean, there's a lot of people that have a very difficult time to buy some of these collectibles that cost five thousand gems, ten thousand gems plus. So at long term. You know, I, I do foresee a lot of these collectibles to to increase in price. And I actually want to ask just the crowd here generally, what do you guys think? Because this is just my opinion. It's not necessarily what's going to happen. But uh, do you guys have any different thoughts? Maybe Chris, I don't know if you have I, 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 I just want to actually add on that quickly. Um, sorry. Sure. Um, this is actually a thought that I had already. And um, like myself and like the VV official Discord mods, we were talking about this before. And typically um, I'll use like, the day that VV got listed on Uniswap as an example, right? 
Um, people thought that, you know, it's going on a DEX, the price of OMI is going to skyrocket and it's going to be at like, you know, five cents or whatnot. But on the day of the listing, the price went down. And then the same thing we see happen across a lot of other cryptos. Yes, certain exchanges like, um, you know, Binance, the price will go up and then at the end it will kind of stay up. It will have a bit of a pullback, but it's because, you know, I believe it's because people are already anticipating that the price is going to go up on the day of an exchange listing. So they sell. And similarly on Vivi, a lot of people, including myself, we're anticipating that, that price is going to go down because of MTL on these collectibles. So we're holding gems ready to buy. And that I think is going to have the reverse effect. People think that the price is going to go down, but a lot of people are actually going to come in waiting for that day to buy. I, I'm, I'm doing it. A lot of the VV Discord mods are doing it. So surely there are other people also, you know, with their stack of gems waiting to buy. And, you know, I want to buy the Amanda Connor Batman. I want to buy, you know, the, the, the pop. 2D decon one. I'm just waiting for the MTL date because I'm thinking that the price is going to go down. But not just that. Um, yes, money will be exiting the app, but money will also be entering the app more easily as well. So I think we could actually see an increase in price on MTL day because those who really, really want to sell, they're not going to sell via MTL. They've just been selling, you know, peer to peer already. So it's it's not like it's impossible to take your gems out. So I think um, those people also do want to avoid KYC as well. So um, I think we're probably not going to see the big seller for it anticipating. I think the price is actually going to go up on MTL day, but that's just my view. Yeah, so my two cents is, is pretty similar. I mean, there's definitely two sides to it. Uh, I think KYC being a, a big deal, I don't think everybody is going to want to put their information in and have it related to their bank accounts. Like people like would rather stay anonymous. So I think that's going to play into it as well. Uh, I do think there's an anticipation, you know, for uh, for MTL to happen. So people like myself have gem, gems prepared just in case. I kind of look at it, it might be more extreme than this, but I kind of look at it like the Disney gem squeeze. And like the best thing for that for me was to just have gems available if it does dip. And then if it doesn't dip, it, it's not the end of the world. Um, I do person, and then like, you know, just talking to new users that are on VV, like every time I talk with somebody who's like kind of wanting to get into VV, like one of the first questions is, okay, well, how do I get my money out? And I have to have the awkward, well, you, you kind of can't yet unless you go third party. And at that point, you might have to do a 0.6 rate. You know, you don't have to have those conversations anymore. I, and not just like normal, I like get normal people, but like there's also whales coming in that are like going to be more okay with putting their money in the app, knowing that they can get it directly back out of the app. All that being said, I don't think it's going to weigh out evenly. I personally do think there's going to be a dip. Um, but to me, as somebody who is bullish on VV and the future of it, that's a buying opportunity for me. That's not like a FUD opportunity of like, oh gosh, I, I think it's a dip that's not going to recover. For me, it's like, okay, great. These things that I've been waiting to go down for a while are finally in price ranges that I, I can buy them at. So I'm able to buy them at those moments. So, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be as extreme as people think. And then I do think that with Immutable X coming, which uh, people were asking earlier about, uh, you know, will you be able to take these NFTs off the platform? I think TAPS kind of touched on that. But uh, certain NFTs and hopefully one day all will be interoperable to where we can take them off of VV and put them onto open marketplaces like Immutable X. And I think that could really balance out MTL as well, especially if it happens around the same time, which it might. I don't know exactly when we're going to see some VV NFTs. I know nobody does on Immutable X, but I definitely think that could add value as well. So, Can I add yeah. one thing? Yeah, go ahead. I, I also think it's brilliant that they're rolling it out in groups, right? Because it almost counteracts the, if you just did it like everyone has access, go ahead and cash out. You would see a more significant dip and then people will react to that dip, right? So the fact that it's rolling out in groups of let's say like 50 or however many they plan on doing it, like people will choose to take profit, some won't, but that that smaller dip will be seen as, okay, like there's a dip here, right? So they sold out of whatever collectible and that'll create that and then people will buy that dip, right? So I think the fact that they're doing it in groups and different types of groups I think that'll kind of counteract a big, massive MTL dip. Yeah, that's. Um, I, I think the beautiful part about VV is we can all have kind of our own opinion of what we think will happen, and um, we can all be right, we can all be wrong. But at the end of the day, it's really cool that VV has such a unique community that everyone kind of does their own thing and they kind of try to figure it out themselves and stuff. But when it comes to all this kind of stuff, it's more of a learning curve for us and trying to understand of seeing how the market reacts to news like this and stuff like that. But um, let's get a little bit into everyone's kind of favorite word, and that's uh, blue chips. And I'm going to try, I'm going to talk with Gail, Chris, and I kind of want to get Sean's input also on the comics and how the grails are. So um, let's start with Sean. Do you think that when it comes to comics, there'll be kind of 
starting to be looked at as grails as well? And do you think that more and more people, as they jump into the app, they'll see comics as true grails when it comes to uh, when they actually start learning about these comic books? Yeah, definitely. I, I think the comics right now, people are starting to see it already. You know, like a good example is Marvel Comics number one. When that first dropped on Vivi, I mean, I was pumped for comic books in general. I was super excited about it. But I was curious, what was going to be the first comic book to drop on Vivi? It's, for me, I thought it was going to be Fantastic Four number one because it's the first comic book from Marvel under the Marvel umbrella. But they decided to go with Marvel Comics one. And I thought, okay, that's interesting because that, that comic has a lot of historical value, but it doesn't have any pop culture value, right? Because it came out in 1939. Um, and there's only 63 physical copies on the CGC census. So it's easy to say there's probably less than 100 copies in existence, right? But um, when they when they announced they're going to drop that book, I'm like, okay, that's cool. So over time, the, obviously the book blew up, everyone knows now, but I can almost guarantee you maybe 1% of people that came onto the app knew about Marvel Comics. And that's probably generous. But I can almost say with confidence, 99% of active users on Vivi know what Marvel Comics 1 is now. And they know the value of that comic. So yeah, I, I definitely think it's... BB is definitely adding a lot of value to a lot of these comics for sure. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out over time. I'm starting to love comics just because of you, dude. Yeah. I think you, <laughs> I think you like, I, I've been saying this on a lot of the streams that me and you have shared, but it, a yeah. lot of credit needs to go to you because you are creating new comic book uh, generation, like new comic book, uh, new lovers and stuff like that. So for me, I'm very thankful that you're a part of this because you give us so much insight into creating these new generation of comic book lovers. And I know a lot of people are always like, when are the real comic book lovers going to come in? But I think you guys are creating the new ones and you guys are bringing them. So it's, it's really, really awesome. And we're hoping to, we're hoping to make a bridge. You know, it's, it's definitely a team effort. There's a lot of great YouTubers out there and, and a big shout out to all those guys. They're awesome, awesome group people. We're all, yeah. And, um, it's exciting. It's exciting. We're all thinking of ways to try to figure out how to get them involved. involved. <laughs> They're stubborn, but... <laughs> awesome. um, so, so Gail, I've seen you cover this a little bit, but do you want to maybe touch on what uh, what what can be kind of considered uh, a blue chip and what it really means? Yeah, so basically, in my eyes, a blue chip is like a brand or a character that's been around for a while. It has like a, a huge fan base, and uh, it's, prob it's basically going to stand the test of time. Like the Todd McFarlane Batman, of course, we always go back to that because it was the first uh, collectible on the app, right? And the first appearance of Batman in NFT format and premium, you know, officially, it's my cat, officially licensed premium quality format. So that is definitely going to stand the test of time. Uh, you know, F.A. Harley Quinn Joker, F.A. Um, yeah, F.A. Harley Quinn and F.A. Joker, first appearance. Those are going to stand the test of time. So usually first appearances, popular characters. Uh, popular brands, those are blue chips in my eyes. Yeah, and uh, Chris, do you think that um, there are currently uh, collectibles on VV? Like, I'll give you my example. I think that one of the collectibles that I think is Kay's favorite one is the DeLorean. <laughs> I think that that one, once the drivable feature gets enabled for, uh, if, if it ever does get enabled again, I think then that one becomes a blue chip. Do you kind of think that that's what happens here, Chris? That's hard to say, man. I, I don't really know. I think it's a really cool and valuable collectible. I, I'm pretty like strict about what I value or what I put as a blue chip. So I wouldn't quite say that, um, you know, blue chips are, I mean, obviously the DeLorean would be like a reputable company, but like I, I immediately think of like Disney or Marvel. And then I think of like their first collectible they ever dropped, their first comic they ever dropped. Um, like, so to me, I guess I have a little bit higher standard. I, I'm not hating on the DeLorean. I have one and I, I love it. I actually posted a video of me like driving mine the other day. But um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know about I'll, I'll classify it as that. Were you the one who tweeted the the blue chip, the the actual bag of the blue chip? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was the one that tweeted that out. So that was fun. And in case anybody's wondering in here, like people were kind of getting pressed about you know using the word blue chip uh, because it's like, oh, this is NFT space, so it technically can't be a blue chip because you never know. Well, yes, but you know we we are mutually agreeing that these collectibles have the better chance of standing you know market fluctuations. Like if they're if MTL causes a big squeeze, which which collectibles will more than likely not go down as much as the rest? If we see a bear market, which collectibles again won't be as affected as much as the rest? It's it's kind of like when we agree that these are blue chips, we mutually agree as a space that these are highly desired collectibles that are licensed by Disney and Marvel and some of the other companies, and that these are are very valuable. So again, like I guess we're not using blue chip in like the traditional sense of blue chip, where you're you get eight percent a year on your stock that you've been investing in for you know the last ten years. We're using it as something that that comes from a reputable company that's trusted by other people and that we think is going to stand the test of time.
Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Uh, Gail, anything else you wanted to say on that topic? Yeah, I mean, just just on the blue chip thing, you know, the original term for blue chip was used in poker to mean like the most valuable chip. So, you know, terms, they get taken and adopted. So whatever we decide to use, if it's widely adopted, then that's what it's going to be. So that on that topic, that's what that's what I want to say on that. But regarding the DeLorean being a blue chip, you know, it uh, the situation can change with a collectible, the value of a collectible. Like in the BB verse, let's say the all the DeLoreans become drivable, and you know, when we have millions of people on the app, it's not going to be a lot of supply. It might be big now because there's not that many, but you know, it may it may turn into a blue chip. So you know, situations change. That's that's basically what I'm trying to say. Just 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 a quick question on that, actually. Um, so would you guys, so based off of everything that you guys have said, would you guys consider the James Bond movie ticket stub a blue chip? Because it's not a brand or a character that's popular. It's a movie ticket stub, but it's extremely valuable. And who's that's the, who's the 007 fan here? <clears throat> who's the 007? Yeah, the I, I will say that we, we haven't seen a sale for it yet. So we don't really know how much it's worth, right? Yeah. So I think that's really important as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... That, okay, that's same. a... That's a great question. I would consider that. Eh, I would it's consider that one. It's, it's I would like, call that a. Sorry, go ahead, I was I was gonna say I, I would call that a grail in my eyes because grails in my in my opinion are items that are highly sought after but almost impossible to reach or they seem impossible to reach and people would almost do anything to get one. So there's blue chips and then there's grails in my eyes. Grails surpass blue chips and are obviously blue chips. So I, I would consider that a grail because there's not that many. You know, like uh, what what is that movie? The Quest for the Holy Grail or the that cup? You know, there's only one, and everybody wants it. So there's only seven tickets, and you know, it's not that popular of an item, but not that many people can have it. So it's a grail in my eyes. But the question is, like, will it stand the test of time? Like that was the end of the Bond series with um, Daniel Craig, and in my opinion, they didn't really end it very well. It wasn't a great movie, but like. I mean, there being seven of seven and, it, and it having a first specific to Vivi, if Vivi is going to continue to just be, you know, grow to 5 million, 10 million users, you know, and be the juggernaut it's going to be, it being the first kind of like tied to utility that has to be remembered and almost promoted, right? Because otherwise people will kind of forget. So that way, how does it remain being relevant a year down the line when we have maybe like a one of one or other rarities of bigger brands, right? So like the price, I think immediately made sense for it to be, you know, 300,000 because it was the rarest thing ever on the app beating out Donnie's and we could compare it to that. But long-term, how many people are going to really like equate that to being that valuable, right? So that's the piece that I'm always kind of questioning, like how much really should a ticket be worth or should you flip it? Yeah, Taps, that's a good point. Because to me... I, I did forget that it was the first uh, collectible tied to like big IP utility, possibly ever in any NFT. I mean, not the first NFT with utility, but the first one tied to IP that large and that I know of. So, I mean, that could go down as like piece of history, but I don't like saying that. And this isn't just the, the um, 007 ticket, but I don't like saying like scarcity alone determines, you know, grails or blue chips. But yeah. I do think that significant specifically of, if Vivi, you know, points this out down the road and people realize the significance of 007 being tied to the first major utility of a big IP. Yeah, I think like a bi businesses might buy that, you know, there, there's several there's companies that might want to own that stub. So, yeah, I mean, it could definitely be factored in as a real or blue chip. I was just yeah, it's, add, it's, also the, um, it's also the only collectible where Vivi does not own edition number one. Good point. That's a really good point. It was said that really good, I don't even know who owns edition number one. The public never found out. Right? They, they released the full seven to the public for that one, right? The movie ticket? Yeah. Was, they didn't keep any. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. The full seven went to the public. Never but we don't know who, well, I don't know who owns number one. It'll be interesting to know who. Yeah. That's yeah, another there. point that oh, sorry. about utility. Uh, I was just going to say, yeah, scarcity, over time, and over the next couple of years, we're probably going to see a lot of scarce collectibles. You know, if we start, what if we see like a, you know, if Disney drops a, a, one, a 10 of a princess, right? One of us, a significant princess, um, we only see 10 collectibles of that one. How's that going to compare to the movie ticket? So um, I, I think at the end of the day, it's important to invest into the IP or actually, or the or the comic, understanding what you're investing into. Because scarcity is out of our control. We don't know what else is coming. We don't know if there's going to be one of ones. It's very possible. So if you buy into scarcity, I think you're, 
it's, it's it may not work out for you in the long run. But what we do know, what you do know is the IP, right? The characters or the comics that you're investing into, you know the value because you can reference it. So that's my thoughts on that. Awesome. So uh, sticking on the topic of like immutable taps, Andy and Kay, you guys can kind of cover this a little bit better. But what should the new users expect when we fully might? Well, we have migrated to immutable, but do you think it'll make it easier? Um, what should we? What should everyone expect with immutable? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I can just uh, kick off that one. Um, so I've actually um, kind of, uh, so I've uh, spoken with the Mutable team as well, just for another project. Um, and I know that they are having some issues with um, scaling and, you know, like a kind of teething issues with the platform, but um, is very, very powerful and it will enable a lot of utility for um, VV NFTs. So um, I've had a look at the API documentation. You can do cool things like, um, you know, have two NFTs kind of linked together. So you could have like a child and a parent NFT. Um, so that essentially would work in the form of accessories. So you could have an, a cape associated with a Superman and that's linked. Or you could have like a signature, a digital signature associated with a resale, for example. So they enable that kind of thing as well as, um, you know, like um, all of the uh, kind of uh, more scalable transactions and, you know, all of the issues that people wanted where it's like interoperable. Um, I don't know with like um, things like their timestamps and whatnot, because I think people are going to be looking at that if it's like more granular than what Vivi is going to provide from uh, GoChain, because one of the other features is they're going to be migrating the metadata from GoChain as a property onto um the new newly minted NFTs, and that's partly because people were complaining, saying, "Hey, um, you know, my NFT, my Todd is no longer going to be, you know, minted on October the fifteenth or whatever it was because it's being reminted." So they're kind of allowing you to um, access that historical metadata on the new NFTs. Um, but yeah, like I think we're going to finally start to see more utility within the NFTs, um, specifically accessories, and you know having NFTs associated with, you know, other digital assets like digital signatures. Um, but outside of that, um, I don't think we'll see like huge amounts of difference. I think it will help us get more exposure though on like other platforms like OpenSea and, you know, um, Mintables and whatever these other like, you know, NFT apps are. Yeah, Taps, have you um, had a chance to play on Immutable? Uh, do you have any experience with that platform? Yeah, so I own a few NFTs on Immutable X and I've, I've played around with it, but I was pretty familiar with Immutable X off the get go because I did um, I, I did play, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, the card game. Gods Unchained. Thank you, Gods Unchained. So I, I played with it for quite some time and that was like when it was really early with Immutable X. And it was kind of like an up and comer, but it hadn't really gotten much spotlight besides Gods Unchained. And so when they announced this, it, you know, I did some digging, but it, it's a pretty big move, especially because when you look at where they were at the start of the year to now, their ecosystem is growing really, really fast. And Ethereum 2.0, it keeps getting pushed out, pushed out, pushed out. And so these layer two scalable solutions, like the, the elephant is, of course, Matic, right? You've seen what Matic has done this year. You've seen how well the NFTs have done this year. And other layer twos are like Arbitrum and Immutable X. And Immutable X is gunning to be a big, big player in the space. And they've been building out specifically the heaviest on the gaming side, which there's tons of big products that are doing, or projects are doing really well. And if you look at the NFTs themselves, all of the, a lot of the, the 10Ks that have been announced have shot up in value as well. There's a lot of spotlight on Immutable X, so much so that Coin Bureau, who's the largest crypto, like crypto centric YouTuber, just covered it and actually gave a spotlight to show. Uh, Omi and Vivi, you know, minting 3 million NFTs onto Immutable X. So there's going to be a lot more awareness from the space as a whole because the spotlight is on Immutable X gunning for a number one spot, not only in the gaming world, but also just as an uh, Ethereum layer two solution. So I think it'll translate really, really well for us on exchanges. I think it'll translate really well for us like to kind of be tiered to Immutable X, but it's a uh, it's going to be really exciting and we'll get into that other, the other side on the, like the Viver side, but their ecosystem is so heavy on a couple things, but there's not really like a centric uh, metaverse uh, category yet on Immutable X. And so we'll probably be the first, if not one of the first on that. So as they gain an exposure, we'll gain an exposure. Andy, what are you most looking forward to when it comes to us moving fully to Immutable? I think it is the exposure. 
you know, I see Immutable sort of like the way Vivi were back in March. You know, there was a lot of issues. There were things that were happening with scaling. There were some more people coming on the platform, but it really is one of those things that could help get so much, so many more eyes on Vivi as a whole. You know, and I've used Immutable myself. I have, um, I have some NFTs on there and it's so easy. It's so, so easy. You know, when it comes to OpenSea, you go on there and you try to buy an NFT and it says $300 for, for gas. And you're sitting there thinking, no, like, I, I could buy so many things on Vivi for this. So when it comes to something like that and people are coming in for the first time and they're seeing it, that they're branded IPs from the biggest brands in the world and they can buy it without gas and allowing that exposure to happen for something like Vivi is just amazing. And, you know, we have heavy hitters as well coming onto it when it comes to things like Super Farm and Gary V's uh, 12 and a half book game that's going to be on it. So I think Vivi are also going to have the connections of learning from those and Immutable can help them do so because they, they can all work together when it comes to that platform to push each other forward, which I'm, I'm just so excited to see what can be done with such a variety of people and powerful people in this space that can help not only Vivi, but themselves and help them all move forward. Awesome. That's a really good take. Anyone else have any take on Immutable? Gail, Chris, Sean? Yeah, I got a little bit. Um, first off, I had, there are some people in the comments just asking what IMX is. So like, is Immutable X is going to be a layer two platform that goes on top of Ethereum. So it's kind of like, uh, it's going to be a lot like OpenSea, except the transactions are going to be like basically no fees is, is zero gas fees so you're able to like buy and sell nfts with you know you pay like fractions of, of 0.0001 eth or whatever um also immutable x is already pretty reputable it has open c integrating with it which this is where the volume is really going to come in because a lot of people think that as soon as we get on immutable x that everything's just going to boom everything's going to skyrocket you're going to be able to sell your labits for one ETH each maybe so I, I don't know the only reason i'm a little skeptical of that is because right now, if you go to Immutascan and you look at the daily trade volume on Immutable X for the last 30 days, it's just not there. The volume's not there. But as Andy perfectly said, it's like Vivi in the early stages. It's not there, but I personally believe that it's coming. And it's it's pretty much guaranteed that it's coming through their partnership with OpenSea. Although, to my knowledge, that's not unraveled exactly how that's going to look. I'm sure OpenSea is going to use Immutable X for some of their projects. But that's when we're going to get immense amount uh, more volume in Immutable X. So it's not there right now, but it's coming. You also have some like major companies already trusting Immutable X. You have TikTok. I mean, TikTok released their moments. They chose Immutable X out of everything. You have major influencers like Gary, Gary Vent. I can never say his last name, Gary V, who uh, his book games NFT is actually going to exist on Immutable X. The game will be able to be played on Immutable X. So Immutable X is amazing. If you've never tried it uh, and you're a new VV user, I'd recommend at least like going, like, you know, looking around the website, looking at the NFTs on there, kind of getting a feel for it. Because my thing is you want to be, you want to try to be first to things, of course. And if you're already familiar with the platform, you already got your MetaMask wallet installed, you're already like playing around with Immutable X. Then once VV does migrate and they do have their interoperable NFTs on there, you'll be the first to know how to list them, how to trade them, how to flip, how to do all that. So it's good to get it familiar with it now because it's definitely VV and Immutable X are going to help each other. They're both monsters. I used to think Immutable X was going to do like so much for VV, which I still do. But now, I mean, I mean, we've got what, 3 million downloads now. So we're going to do so. VV is going to do so much for Immutable X as well. Uh, they're just going to complement each other and both, you know, into the future. Could I add one other piece? Sorry, just I'm thinking that there's like new users see questions around Immutable X and all that. And so just so people understand too, when you buy an NFT, buy, sell, or whatever on OpenSea, you're using MetaMask and it costs gas, right? So with Immutable X, it's like a one-time, very small fee to basically enable the ability to buy and sell in there with that collection. And from there, you can buy and sell your collectibles seamlessly, right? So like, it is very, very much more a cost effective way to do so, but it's also tied to ERC 1155. So when you notice, like when we announced uh, Mutable X, a lot, a lot more people started uh, collecting matching mint numbers because you will, in theory, be able to batch sell or group sell, you know, maybe your entire season one or season two of Batman or, or you know, whatever. So it gives a lot more scalability and it makes the most sense for a collectible platform like VV, and you'll be able to spend ethereum so when i bought my guild of guardians i spent ethereum in there not fiat you know not omi or, or whatever so you'd actually be able to spend directly ethereum so that enables also those big big ethereum whales who they want to buy things you know with their crypto and not spend fiat 
Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I think Immutable X was a game changer. The more I learn about it, the more you kind of understand the impact <clears throat> that it's going to have on VB. Um, Kay, I think you actually had a pretty interesting question for the entire panel, if you want to go ahead. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, so this is actually a really, really important topic, and it just made me realize, because, um, you know, from day one, um, I had this question about VV. Uh, so the question is, firstly, um, back when we had that, you know, that glitch with the uh, Ultraman drop, um, I don't know how many of you guys participated in that, I seem like most of you guys did, but um, those who uh, did have the bugged out drop, you got airdropped a um, secret rare Ultraman poster, and very recently, we also had an airdrop of the Golden Tricks Bunny for old for all the people who held the full set of Run English collectibles. So my question for you guys is, you might have noticed that both airdrops, they were priced. They actually put a price in the store for them. It was it was about one gem or you know some something really low. Um, why did, why did Vivi price these collectibles at one gem? If, if they were given airdropped, but you know they put it as one gem on retail. Any anyone can have a guess. Do you, do you think they have to? Like, would they be able to do something where it just says free, or do you think it's like a must uh, where some price has to be there? I know that's such a simple, stupid answer, yeah. but I mean, it, it, I, I think they could technically put it at like zero point zero not one gems, but um, it, it's not really related to that. But they had to put it at like a very very stupidly low price for a, a very important reason, and now it's made sense to me. Take it I'm away, Sean. Take it Give away, you guys Sean. Have ten seconds if you have one for anything. What was the? Sorry, I was typing. What was the question? <laughs> uh, so why did Vivi place the Ultraman secret rare as well as the Tricks Bunny for one gem on retail? Okay. I'm, I, 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 is it blockchain okay, related? Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's not drop, blockchain right? related. Not blockchain related. It's 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 not technical related. It's not because it was given out as an airdrop, so that way it's when it's reflected in um, like you cashing out, like the transaction, it shows that it's just one gem versus you know it being at a floor price and being um, a difference in what you cash out at. Well, um, not not quite. It's that's closer. So basically, okay. So this goes back to a question that I had about Vivi. So firstly, um, we know that any any project um, similar to Vivi or let's just say Vivi. Um, the OMI token, wherever happens, that's always going to exist. You know, it's not going to get removed or, you know, tampered with by some regulatory authority. But Vivi, the company, that can be regulated. That can be, you know, uh, the government bodies can go after Vivi. They can, you know, do whatever it is that they want to do. Um, but this goes to an important point. So uh, yesterday, Coin Bureau, they made a very, very important post where they said that a lot of um, countries in Asia, uh, South Korea, as an example, uh, they've started um, going after companies which are offering play to earn platforms or any platform which you can make money off of them. And they are starting to remove any platform where you can make more than $10 um, given to you. So I asked this question before um, where a lot of people were like, when's Vivi going to start offering, you know, OMI tokens for staking or when am I going to start giving, you know, things that are, you know, actually worth something. Um, and Vivi, they've, I, I thought about this, but now it's actually made more sense is if they were to give you a collectible price that, you know, a thousand dollars retail and you have that and then you sell it for $2,000, that could put Vivi in some kind of, you know, hot water with these regulatory authorities in other countries. You know, we might see Vivi get delisted in South Korea, for example. But I said that a loophole could be, what if they give you an NFT that's priced at zero, the retail value is zero, so they're not breaking any kind of regula like any kind of, you know, uh, regulation. And now that you own an NFT that's worth zero gems or zero dollars, if you were to then sell it on the secondary market, which Vivi has no control over, it could be OpenSea or wherever, you, people are paying for it what they believe it's worth. So you've been given something that Vivi values at one dollar or zero dollars, but now people are paying more for it, which is how I believed it could work. And now that finally Coin Bureau uh, kind of started to highlight this issue with a lot of play to earn platforms, that they are now having to you know face all of these you know, this onslaught of regulations, they're kind of now having to 
you know, either restructure the whole platform or, you know, um, face whatever penalties it is that are being thrown at them and get delisted and, you know, deal with all that fun. But Vivi, they protected themselves from day one. And I think that is probably the reason why they always price these airdrops at one gem is because they don't want to be giving away something for free that's got a high monetary value attached to it just because they are already very familiar with security laws and, you know, um, giving away things of a high, you know, a high value and what kind of repercussions that could have for them as a company uh, when it comes to these regulations. We got some uh, some super chats here and maybe we can use this kind of segue into kind of a different different topic here. So from Yannette, what do you guys think about low mint drops like today's? I'm certain you all saw the prices in the market plate. Place is it being overvalued since it's not F4? And another question here, if you guys want to address that later, is Vivi interested in using their NFTs as collateral for loans like Kraken? Thanks. Uh, Gail, you want to touch on the first one, Gail? On the first question? Yeah, I think I think what Vivi did today was really interesting. I think that gave a lot of data to a lot of people. A lot of lessons were learned, and a lot of lessons are being learned. So when you drop something that scares. It makes you think of, you know, what is the value of this particular item? Today it was a comic book. And as we know, comic books have real life value. So we always go back to the real life, you know, value of the comic. And now we got to factor in the scarcity versus the real life value versus, you know, it's an NFT, which is a new product. It's a new, it's a new thing. You know, a lot of us are, we're trailblazing in this industry right now. And what is, what is the value of NFTs going to be as a whole? So a comic NFT that already has real real world value, there's just so many factors. And I made a post today that people can list these NFTs for whatever they want. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the value is going to be. And then number two, you know, an NFT is worth as much as somebody's willing to pay for it. So whatever reason you give for making those purchases, you know, that's the reason. So it's, it's really a speculative drop today. And, you know, people made some speculative buys and sells. And I think time will tell. With, with future drops of similar drop edition sizes. And I think time will tell. It's really it's really interesting to see what happens with these kind of size drops. For sure, yeah. I think it's, me personally, <clears throat> um, I, I, it's hard when there's low mints because I, I try to go for every drop. So this one, I was like, mm, like should I even try? Because it's like, a, what, did they, what did Rise say? 1.5 million users, active users on the app now. And then, um, I know people are always complaining about like bots and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, it's not, it's less than 1% of the people who will be able to get this comic, even if bots didn't exist. So it's one of those where it's so scarce. And I think it, it, the Gail said it well, that it's a learning curve. It's something that they can learn from. It's uh, probably like an experiment that they do to just to try to find out how the community feels about this kind of stuff. But um, I always give Vivi the credit and the people who are working there, the credit of being smarter than we are because they know what they're doing. And they have a plan with everything that they do but me personally i would prefer not to see too many low mints but it just depends on the collectible it depends on the the licensors the ips and all that kind of stuff but yeah <clears throat> you gotta go for every drop man or at least at least the, yeah, yeah. the comics i mean i have a I buddy mean, who he uh he only goes for the comics because they're like the digital lottery tickets right like you never yeah. like someone's gonna win right so you have to go for it and today like kind of like how the gail said is like man like some people made tens of thousands of dollars if you got lucky on the drop some people lost you know ten thousand dollars if you bought the secret rare at like 35k now it's down to 26k so it's like there's definitely some craziness happening in the markets and there's some losses is, is that the price for it right now i haven't even looked at the market is that, is, i just looked at it while we were on stream it's 26.5 <laughs> wow uh, the, the biggest question people didn't ask themselves is you know a couple years down the road when there's 500 comic books on VV and there's 30 grails and there's a lot more scarce scarce collectibles and we just heard confirmation there's gonna be one of ones. How is this comic going to stand? How is it going to how is it going to do against the test of time, right? That's super important to ask yourself. And you can do that, you can check on the physical on its physical counterpart. I mean right now there's over 16,000 uh, comics, physical comic books on the CGC census of this comic alone. And as a 9.8 it's worth about fifteen hundred dollars. So would spend thirty thousand dollars on a secret rare of this comic, which I mean to me it, it's a it's a great comic book, but you have Fantastic Four number one, which is a true grail, which in its highest grade I think will sell for over five million dollars. You have an opportunity to get three secret rares, which is about the same value as one 
cigarette rare of today's comic. I mean, to me, they're just, you got to think about those things, guys. Because long term, scarcity is going to matter less and less, in my opinion. And it's all going to be about the big IP, the big comic books. That's really what it comes down to. And you got you got to do your research. You got to research what you're investing into, and don't buy into scarcity and hype because you're going to be disappointed. For sure. So let's stick on that topic for a bit, Sean. Um, can you educate some of the new users and why it's important to kind of start paying attention to comics? And uh, one cool. question that I actually got from some people is, you know how in VD we have season one, season two, season three, season four. Do you think that the comics fall under the same kind of category where we're potentially seeing like comics in season one? And what's your take on this? Yeah. Okay. So comic books, why invest in comic books? Well, they're awesome. <laughs> There's a little bias there. But, you know, this actually, it's an opportunity to invest in characters that you love. If you enjoy the MCU, you have an opportunity to invest in these characters. Really, that's what it comes down to because these comic books you know, the big comic books are the first appearances of, ca of these characters, right? So it's exciting. You have an opportunity to invest in those. Um, and also, uh, what else, what other investment can you spend $7 on and potentially 2x to 100x or even today 3,000x within 30 minutes and, and make $20,000 just literally like that? It's incredible. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity here, and it's only going to get bigger over time. I mean, the majority of people I've talked to in the space have never been collectors. And now they're just so pumped about it, the digital and physical side. It's an exciting opportunity. The community is incredible. So yeah, definitely give it a try because it's a super low risk, high reward situation. One of the best, actually, in my opinion, on the entire internet. So yeah, definitely yeah. get involved. And we talked about this earlier, and uh, I think the Gail or Sean, you guys can both kind of touch on this, but do you guys think that there comes a time when the 9.8 uh, ones on in the real world get overtaken by the ones on VV? And do you think like that the VV prices will eventually be higher than the <laughs> yeah. ones in the real world? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love this question. So uh, we actually create a system that that shows the CGC grading scale and compares it to mint numbers. And our belief is that the top 2% of a collection is equivalent to like a 9.8 grade, for example. So if there's a 30,000 mint collection, the 600 mint and below would be in the top 2%. Now, the top 1%, which would be equivalent to a 9.9 .9 grade, is, is 300 or less, right? So here's a good, great example, and this is what I get really excited about. <laughs> you know, Fantastic Four number five, right? At nine point, there's less than 2,000 total physical editions on the CGC census. As a 9.6 grade, which is its highest grade, there's no 9.8 grades in existence. There's only three 9.6 grades, and those comics have never sold. And we may never see those comics ever be sold because the people who own them want to own them. They don't want to sell them. So here's the question. So if, if someone has a sub 300 secret rare, a Fantastic Four 5, which is equivalent in our grading system to a 9.9, .9, is that comic worth more than the 9.6 physical counterpart? And the physical counterpart, in my opinion, if it ever does sell, it would be over a million dollars. So, so you, is this you, comic you, you, you think that's where we see the VV prices going in some of them as well? I think it's very, very possible. It's very possible. I mean, I think the grails especially are going to really surprise us in a way that, I mean, the biggest thing too is like for the physical comic books, people are paying cash with this, right? So like the highest sale of all time is a 9.6 um, Amazing Fantasy 15, a 9.6 grade, which sold for $3.6 million. I can only imagine when you have an opportunity to buy with crypto, <laughs> like with these physical comic books, it's going to be wild. So these NFTs are, I think, going to take it to a whole new level. Because I, I look at them as equals. That's just me. And I, I know, I, I firmly believe that, that Marvel would market as marketing in the same way. They, they consider them its, its equal counterpart. I have a question, uh, comics and crypto. <clears throat> Maybe this is kind of an obvious question or, 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 or answer, but uh, do you really think that people who collect physical comics are going to get into VV comics and collect those and those values will be just as high as some of the real world comics. I mean, you know, for, from my understanding, you know, a lot of these comics are rare because, you know, they're, they're paper, they, they degrade, you know, these comics, they won't ever degrade unless someone like just log logs out of their account or like forgets about yeah. it. But do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, so for graded comics, they're encapsulated, right? So as long as they stay within that case, they'll always retain that graded value. Right. And at the end of the day, the only thing that differentiates the value of these I mean, I understand people want to say that, oh, well, the situation, you grade the physical comic book, I get it. But at the end of the day, it's really about just the number, right? They, they determine the value based on the number that it's given. And that's why I strongly believe that physical comic collectors are going to adopt this space really, really easily. 
is really easy for them because it's, that's really what it comes down to. It's just you're, you're evaluating the, uh, the comic edit with a number. Um, but what, what was the other question? Do, do I think comic collectors are going to adopt the space? Yeah, I mean, just when yeah. when you say something is going to be like a million dollars, like I think even someone had a question. Oh, here yeah. They said, uh, oh, you know, yeah, I, Mark I says, you. yeah, yeah then, then why would they sell four of them for seven dollars each if they're worth millions? I, I think okay. that's a good segue. Yeah. I just want to hear yeah, your thoughts. 100%. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, a perfect example is Marvel Comics number one. There's only 63 copies, physical copies in existence on the CGC census. I would say there's probably, it's very easy to presume there's less than 100. Because some people, you know, this is on the CGC census, that means it's basically comics that are graded and in their system. And they're the biggest graded system in the world. You have a couple other ones, but everyone uses CGC for the most part. There's CBCS as well. So there might be a few more, but I think under 100 is a very fair estimate. Now, people, when that, if they're not even for sale, the only real opportunity to buy this comic is in digital format. Between the secret rares and these physical comic books, there's only 663 potentially in existence, maybe 700. That's wild. I mean, if you think about that, it's just it's just a VB drop alone for one collectible. That's very scarce. But we're talking about the most scarce, one of the most scarce comic books of all time, and combine that with its NFT counterpart. That's wild. That's wild. So I I, I truly believe that, that the sky's the limit for the Grail comics and for a lot of these comics as well. And I think it's exciting too. I think you know you, Ultimate Fallout number four. I'm actually really excited about because again. It's not a scarce book in the physical world. There's a tremendous amount of graded 9.8s, but it still has a very high value, about two to three thousand dollars, and it's only going to go up because of the popularity of the character. Because people love Miles Morales and Spider-Man. He's an awesome character, and I think these NFTs can really surprise us as well over time. I think it's really exciting to see where this one can go. Yeah, I think on behalf of kind of all of us here, Taps, uh, you can go in a second, but I think on behalf of all of us here, we're really thankful for like the information that you put out, and we're really thankful for like how you kind of educate people. And you're so such a fun character when it comes to educating about comics too. You make it so easy to understand. So I think I speak for everybody where we kind of say thank you for all that you do and everything that you. I, I, I appreciate that. Out. Thanks so much. It's it's a yeah. it's real team effort with Spencer and Kevin. Big shout to those guys because they're Spencer actually organized that system, and and Kevin does all of the artwork, and we just all work together on it, and it's a lot of fun. And I appreciate the kind words. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And in regards to the sticker that just went up, uh, great to see you guys together. So much knowledge up here, guys. Do you think it's possible to make money? on vv on a small budget kizzy i started in may with 125 dollars, and i've never actually added since and i've turned into a collection that's uh, i don't even want to speculate on the value but it is uh, quite up there so it's very possible um i kind of interpret it as vv is kind of like a game and it's kind of like school where if you really want to be successful in vv you dedicate the time to it and you try to learn you try to study the market and stuff like that and if you dedicate the time to it it's like studying for a test you'll do well if you <clears throat> put the time in so um but with that let's move on a little bit sorry sean taps did you guys have something to say i just have one more thing to say there's a really cool project that you should follow called the thing to donnie and it's a a project that amazing basically project. is a um, amazing yeah it's project. such a cool project an awesome group of uh, these australian guys awesome dudes and they're basically buying they bought a thing a marble thing for four gems and their their goal is to flip it all the way up to a donnie which is worth about what $150,000 for right now, I think. And they're, they're, I know they're past a thousand gems right now. Um, but when they when they achieve the Donnie and they sell it, they're going to donate all the money to charity. So it's a really incredible project, amazing group of guys. Like I just strongly recommend everyone following their journey. It's just so much fun, and they're just wonderful people. So support them every way you can. Yeah, these guys are awesome. What they're doing is also for charity and stuff. So it, it's such a cool thing. Um, but let's move on a little bit here, guys. Let's talk about some collecting tips. And I think Kay, Andy, and the Gail, you guys can kind of cover this one um, one by one. And uh, for the new users, what are some tips that you guys can give them when it comes to collecting? And um, you can kind of talk about your own journey as well, like how you collect and what you look for. I know that Kay collects, like, he did you just reach your 69 set or was it something along those lines? uh yeah well i'm on i'm on 68 I, c I could have actually hit 69 uh even 70 today um nice. but you know it, go it goes back to the mtl thing that we said earlier is uh, I'm, I'm i'm just gonna chance it and wait and hopefully the stuff i want to buy like goes down a little bit in value um but yeah like typically my, my collection strategy is the same as my investment strategies um because uh, i got into crypto back in 2016 and i made all of the stupidest moves you know i bought i bought ethereum and then uh I bought it at like $150 and then it went down to $120 and I panic sold. And this was back in 2016, like a proper, you know, absolute noob. Um, but, you know, since since then, you know, um, and trading stocks as well, like 
typically my strategy is when the market opens, um, I'll kind of have a look around, see what's on there. But if in most most cases, I'll just wait. Um, and then when the prices are down, I'll always try and aim to try and buy one of everything at least. Um, I, I'm one of those people who only very recently started stacking very specific collectibles. But since I joined Vivi, I'd always bought one of everything. So I've got like one of the Dragon Girl set, one of the Ultramans, etc. Um, but now my strategy has changed slightly and I'm now looking at collectibles which aren't blue chips. I know some people just go entirely for blue chips, but that's kind of out of the price range for uh, new people. So now what I think is, a, in my opinion, a, a good strategy is identify collectibles you know will have utility in Vivi moving forward. So one example are the common DeLoreans, right? Those were sat below 30 gems for ages. They started to creep up up to 60 gems. When they're drivable, which they definitely will be, what would the price be then? 100 gems, 150, 200. Those are the kind of things that I would collect. Um, Labbits, for example, Frank Kozik has been going on like every day now about the Labbit breeding. Um, right now, you know, the cheapest Labbits were set at about 45 gems. Uh, today, they've like pumped up to um, 62 for the Elf Labbit. And I feel that when the breeding is officially announced by Vivi, that's when, you know, those um, Labbits are going to be more valuable. So I think, you know, in terms of my collecting strategy now is to go for NFTs that are guaranteed to have utility, which Vivi hasn't officially announced themselves like properly yet, and then just stack those up and then wait for that announcement. And you know, it they they may sit at this set floor price for ages, but um, at least I know it will happen, and it's a bit of a safer play for me. But that's just myself. Yeah, Andy, Gail, do you guys have any other collecting tips that you'd like to share or kind of speak about your journey? And I know you guys make YouTube videos about it all the time. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, first of all, 100% agreeing with you here. The What I've seen from OpenSea and Immutable is when the announcements happen, when it comes to something going on and the official announcement happens, that's when people FOMO into them. And if you're someone who does look to make money on here, then that would be the best place to sell some of them and then wait on after some things happen. And if it's the breeding, waiting on after that, because you're probably going to get a lower price. Um, but when it comes to just in general collecting, for there's a lot of new people on the platform i always tell people and i know it's a lot harder than it seems but just watch first don't do anything don't buy anything don't phone into anything don't listen to people on twitter just watch the market use the comey wiki understand why things happen watch the market when an announcement is made for a big brand or a big drop is going to happen because I think, as Kay said, when he was back in 2016, I've made the same mistakes when it comes to the market. I'm sure every single one of us have done the same. <laughs> so it's so upsetting when you buy something. It's such a high price and it never reaches that <laughs> another three or four months because you're just holding the bag. So my advice for anyone who's collecting is, first of all, just put some gems in if you're putting them in and go for every drop. You're, you're unlikely to get many of them. I barely get any drops anymore, but... The fact that you can do it, as Taps was saying, you know, sometimes you can go for that drop and your, your life changed in that one drop. But watch the market first. Understand that a little bit more. See why things move because it's just kind of like stocks and crypto. They move and fluctuate depending on certain things that are going on. So by doing so, you're going to learn and become better. And you could even maybe do something like Trading212 does where they have that sort of paper account where you'd write down, this is what I'd buy at, this is maybe what I'm planning to sell at, you see if it goes that direction, and then you're getting better with your knowledge. And as Gibby said before, you know, if you're wanting to make money on this, you're going to have to put in the time. Back in March and April, I was spending, it's really sad, but it was about 10 hours a day buying and trading stuff on Vivi, watching auctions, getting deals on auctions, seeing where things moved. And that's why I've had the opportunity to get some of the things I've always desired. And I always thought I'd be outpriced of them because I put in the work. So to sort of round up that absolute blabber of everything that I said, watch the market, don't phone one to things, put the gems in for the drops just to go for them. And you'll understand a lot more than you think. Yeah, yeah, the Gail. Um, I know you, you got your YouTube channel and stuff, and you're very insightful on Twitter. Do you want to share some of your tips? Yeah, um, there's so many thoughts. I don't, don't even know where to start. But first, I guess you might want to decide, what are you? Are you a collector? Are you a flipper? Are you going to be a combination of both? I started off on Vivi as a collector. I wanted to complete as many sets as I could. And I have up to, like, what, 30-something sets now? And... The longer you spend on Vivi, your strategy is going to change. You know, some things are going to start to make sense to you. Some things, you know, you're going to, as you continue to learn, 
you're going to realize that holding certain NFTs don't really make any sense anymore. You know, you're going to want to put that money into more assets that are more liquid or that might, you know, might be able to move more. Um, yeah, like, so right now, collecting sets isn't that important to me anymore. Like, we we learned all the details of the Master Collector program, and we were kind of speculating on that. And now that we have all the details, I'm learning that, you know, okay, it's kind of secondary. I'm, I'm here to make money, but I've also become a collector by being here so long and, you know, falling in love with the with the NFTs and stuff. And, you know, there's really no wrong way to VV also. You know, um, you got you to gotta put in the time. You're going to make your mistakes. People call that tuition like today. Some people paid thousands of dollars for this comic because they had no idea what it was. And this is a lesson that they're going to take to heart. Hopefully it hurt because they're not going to make it again. Most likely the, the more, the harder the lessons, the, the, the more you're not going to, the more likely it is that you're not going to make the same mistake. So, you know, it, it, it does pay to, it, it does pay to sit back and watch the market. But at the same time, uh, you, you can't get your feet wet, you know, make some trades and see what happens, you know? Um, there's so much to say. I don't even know where to, where to, you know, where to take it. No, I think that's really helpful, but I think it's important. Like for, from my perspective, when I started, I was a flipper. Um, I, I would still say I am a flipper now, but I've flipped my way into collecting and becoming a collector. And I think it's very important that people understand that you can be both and you don't have to necessarily just stick to one uh, outcome. Like, because for me, flipping has allowed me the ability to become a collector. Because if I started with 125 and I just kind of put it in and then never flipped, I would have never had the opportunity to create a vault like I have. So I think it's important that people kind of understand that it, it's cool to flip. You don't always have to do it, but it does give you the opportunity to turn into a collector. And me, I never collected prior to VV, but becoming a flipper and starting my journey in VV and studying the product and stuff like that, it, it has allowed me to become a, a collector. And I think a lot of people who are just jumping into VV and kind of starting out, they're becoming collectors now because they see where this is going and um, what's actually happening, what's happening behind the scenes. But there's so much opportunity, but you shouldn't not necessarily like, turn away flipping because you think that being a collector is more valuable. I think it's very important to know that you can be both. Uh, Chris, I think you had something that you wanted to add. Yeah, a, f a few things. One, uh, definitely just create your own game plan and have your own strategies and be okay with taking your own profits. You know, Just because all of Twitter and social media is holding said collectible, just keep in mind that like if you wanted to 5X and you 5X and then you sold because you stuck to your game plan and then it 10Xs, like, that's okay. You know, Do something else with that money. I tell people that all the time. I took profits on my UR Mickey. I'm so sorry. Like, you know, throw stones at me or whatever. I also had probably the highest floor sell sell on the platform. At, I sold at 6.3. Since then, my, my logic was I'm a good trader um, more than the average person. Like I, I've do, done like 10 X's on my entire, like a lot on my initial investment. So I know that with those 6K gems that I got after fees, is probably like 5,800. Um, I'm able to easily 2x that going other avenues. So like just making your own game plan and like executing that is like so valuable. And then just like all like what all you guys just said, uh, I went from a flipper to a collector and now I'm able to just buy things that I want and that I like. And for me at the end of the day, like it's okay if those things don't keep going up in value because like I like them. Like they look cool in my vault. They're gonna be cool in the V verse. And again, like I have that mentality, it's hard for me to let go of things. I saw somebody earlier in the comments say, uh, something along the lines of like why even buy other collectibles like when there's and when uh the money's in the blue chips like we still collect things we like and then, i mean there's a lot of other reasons why you wouldn't want to do that but like i enjoy having a diverse portfolio and collecting things that i like so yeah just have your own game plan me and sean talked a lot about that the other day sean i think you wanted to add something yeah, I mean, first I want to say I respect the hell out of everybody in this room so you guys you've taken this advice because <laughs> it's really really good um we're also really important guys mint numbers matter you know especially if you're coming in it's new, you're new to the space mint numbers matter you know they sell for a premium on vb and i've seen many times you know people drop in like sub 100s or very or sub 1000s if there's like a 10 15 20 000 total edition run for the collectible or comic they'll drop in low mint numbers at four prices and they just don't understand and i, I i've been there I, i've been <laughs> when i first came to the app i remember i sold on auction like a number 45 minted like it was a dragon girl and I sold it for an auction for like $400. And I was like, oh, sweet. This is awesome. But then I realized, what did I just sell? I don't understand why. <laughs> so, guys, just make sure you understand the value of mint numbers. Keep your eye, keep, keep your eye on, the, on the marketplace. 
you know, on the four values for a lot of these comics, because you'll get an understanding of where the value of these are going. You'll see repetition, you know, so, and hit any of us up anytime. And there's a lot of other wonderful YouTubers out there that have amazing advice, but most importantly too, do your own research, you know, look into the IP, look into these comic books and invest your time. The more time you put into this space, you're going to learn so much. Hey, uh, Andy, you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> I was actually watching Harry Potter today as well. <laughs> I was <laughs> so there you go for everyone i know there was like seven requests for different things to say <laughs> but yeah there's your harry potter wendy i hope you have a safe flight as well yeah that's awesome um we can kind of jump on to the next topic because it does kind of collect uh connect uh k taps uh daniel you guys can kind of jump on this one do you guys collect on low mints or do you guys go based off of floor prices and do you think you can kind of do both um for myself so if it's something that i okay so there's two ways that i go by if it's something that i want because i want to complete the set then usually i'll go for floor price because for that i'm never gonna let go of it i'm just gonna hold it so for me the mints aren't as important i just want that thing um you know as a display piece the where i do care about mints is for example um i'll use you know since i've already been doing it i'll use the labits for example right um, there's very, there's like a very small price difference between a three digit mint labit and a four digit mint labit. So I've been just, you know, casually looking throughout the day, whenever a three digit comes up, that's, you know, kind of close to floor price, I'll just buy it. Um, so for the ones where I'm co collecting, because I feel like those are the ones where I'm going to sell these in the future to fund, you know, buying the things that I want. Um, that's when I will care about mint number because I know lower mint, the higher the value of the collectible the more of a price difference there'll be between the higher mints and the lower mints. And that I've just, uh, that's a pattern I've just noticed over time. So for the things I'm going to flip, I uh, care about mints for the things that I'm going to hold forever or, you know, close to forever. I don't really care about the mints. Yeah. I'm kind of similar with K like very, very like if I'm going to hold it forever, I don't like, I want to try to get a, you know, like a lower edition number, but the only time I really care about like a low mint is if it's I'm able to snipe one for like, you know, someone's kind of overlooking it, but I'll also try to time uh, like a lower edition of a, of a collectible. Usually like once things have cooled down from some of the MCP articles that we've seen, I've noticed that people kind of start forgetting about that. We're going to get more points based on lower mint numbers and the, like the bottom 5% as well as sometimes like a secret rare. So when I want to complete a secret rare of a set or just grab one that I've wanted, or if I want to get a lower edition, I'll look after there's been some cool down period of the MCP article. And I know there's gonna be another article and then that's when I would flip it, right? Because then people are going to start snatching up lower editions and start caring about that again. And so that's kind of been my strategy when it comes to lower editions, but usually I just collect what I want. That's funny. It's, it's posture. <laughs> They're complimenting your pocket. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the girl, you want to jump in here? Yeah, so I'm a little bit different. So when it comes to low mints, I I like collecting low mints for stuff that I'm going to hold long term because I, I recognize that we are all here on BB super early and I've become a collector and part of, that, part of collecting is like flexing on people, right? So I want people to come into this app and say, how did you get a three digit Batman and stuff like that? So yeah, I, I care about low mints in terms of flexing and, you know, collecting same mint sets. I know that's super hard. Uh, but that's another that's another thing because there's different levels of collectors. People will come into this app, and they will have a they will have a certain number that th that they're looking for. And I think there's going to be a function within BB where we're able to message each other and say, "Hey, you got this mint. I'm willing I'm willing to pay this much for it." So I, I collect low mints for that too. I'm waiting for people to come in with specific numbers in mind, and I will sell it if the price is right. So there's a couple of reasons why I collect low mints. Yeah, I'm kind of the same. Um, I know that they added uh, that they they said that the MCP is the first what 300 or something along those lines. Um, I think it's important to, for people if they want to collect for MCP, do it, but don't make that your entire collecting strategy. Me personally, I collect what I like, what I know of in the real world and stuff like that. But I like to collect things that are under 300 mint. I know it kind of breaks the bank sometimes, but it just gives me the satisfaction of knowing that I have something that's such a low number, and then it gives me like it's really cool to look at it but um sean chris do you guys have anything to add 
Yeah, I mean, as as a as a collector, yeah, you obviously you should collect whatever you want. And but as an investor, it's, it's important to keep an eye on those those little mints because they, a lot of whales are, are coming hard at those too. Um, but also, it's not just low mints; it's also numbers connected with the NFT itself, right? So, like comic books, for example, the year the comic book was released, like for example, like um, you know, Amazing Spider-Man number one, uh, nineteen sixty-three. So that's really essentially a one of one because there's only one of it's one of a kind. So I anticipate that collectors or comic collectors will pay a premium for these comics because it's really just one in the entire collection out of 60,000 editions for Amazing Spider-Man number one. There's only one of that kind, right? But even like Walt Disney, like the Walt statue, the year that he was born, 1901, very significant. The year that Disneyland opened, 1955. Those are very, very significant years. So do your research on this on, your, on the IP or comic books. Know these significant years because it will probably pay off in the long term, not financial advice. Yeah, so my two cents. One, that's really cool. And I always try, if there's a new comic book, I'll like message Sean, like, hey, what, you know, where are the mints? And like, he'll share them sometimes. Uh, personally, I have slightly different approach to mints. Uh, I do think lower mint obviously is more valuable, I, but I typically don't go for lower mints unless I hit them on drop or I snipe them or there's just an insane deal that I can't pass up. Like if there's a three digit mint, like a little bit above floor, like, of course, I'll, I'll snag that, you know, uh, or if it's like a secret rare and it's like 100 or 200 more, you know, I'll do that. But what I do look for a lot is and this is for things that I'm more so willing to flip is I look at floor and I do decide which floor mint is is better. And again, if it's only like, say, we're talking about secret rares, if it's only a couple hundred dollars off, I'll, I'll go for that slightly better mint so for instance on the my fantastic four number five purchase when i purchased the secret rare it was uh in the top like 11 or 12 percent and i paid like 200 extra dollars for it opposed to like you know a higher percentage um and for me it's like for for really anything especially like cheaper items i know that if i go to sell it and i list it around floor then it's more likely to sell than others around floor because there's also people like me thinking the same thing so i guess fantastic four number five wasn't the best example but like take that with anything take that with commons i'll go for something again that's like almost floor but like not absolute floor that's a better mint that way i know if i let go of it in the future i'm more likely to be able to sell it off quicker yeah yeah that's awesome um everyone's still okay for time we only have a couple more that we'd like to cover but everyone's still good uh, so now I think it's time to get to everyone's favorite subject, and it's one that Taps can cover very well. Let's talk about the VVverse. Okay, Taps, do you guys want to take this one away? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so VVverse, um, for those who don't know, it's kind of VV's iteration of um, of a metaverse. Um, for those who don't know what metaverse is, essentially the way that I describe it is um, just a kind of 3D, it doesn't have to be 3D, but a online platform where people can kind of come together, they can communicate, they can, you know, share their own experiences um, through, you know, more than one medium, you know, um, visually through voice, etc. So the VVverse, um, we had a few kind of um, hit, like, I guess we could say leaks. Um, we know that there's going to be a central point called VV City. Um, you will be able to buy land within the VVverse. Um, but if you don't buy land, that doesn't mean you can't build things on the VVverse. Instead, what you can build on is something called the Ether, which is going to be sort of another accessible part of the VVverse, but it won't be kind of, I guess, the central part of the VVverse. Um, and people can still build and stuff on there. I don't know if there'll be too much of a difference between what you can and can't do between the Ether and actual land on the VVverse. Imagine there will be a difference just because there has to be some incentive for people to go and buy you know this land because typically what we've seen in other projects is digital land it tends to go for stupid amounts so i believe there should be some kind of benefit to incentivize people to go out and get involved in you know land purchases on the vvverse but i know that there will be some form of gamification as well i spoke to dan about this and there's definitely going to be some form of gamification in the vvverse which uh you know it's been suggested that it's going to use omi in some way to add omi utility so people who aren't aware of that because it has not officially been announced by vv for those who kind of engage with the team you know they've done this before in the past where you know those who take the time to talk with them they'll learn more about the project as opposed to just you know waiting for the official announcements um and you know we had um one of the Comey uh, advisors come on the Twitter spaces and he kind of shared his thoughts saying that, you know, we should be able to kind of purchase similar to, to the app, but within the VVverse certain assets as well. And I think we will have the option to do that. Um, but the VVverse opens up more opportunities because with a new platform, there's 
more uh, VV branded IP they can drop. And the really, really important part to VV branded IP is because it's owned by VV, it's not owned by a third party, they can choose what they want to do with the uh, revenue that they generate. So if they want to sell it all in OMI tokens and then burn 100% of the OMI as opposed to just buying back 7%, which is what they do now, they can choose to do that. And they have actually said that is what they're going to do. And a lot of people aren't aware of that. So that's why I believe when the VVverse kicks in and these new types of uh, VV branded IP start dropping, that's when we're going to start to finally see you know, some, some, some more interesting movement in OMI price. But yeah, I think VVverse is probably the right step to go forward. I do have one caveat that I do want to emphasize. And for those who <laughs> were there during the, uh, the, the Comic-Con drop, San Diego Comic-Con, there was like a, a, a third party that built a metaverse experience for Vivi, and it was pretty janky. Um, I know people have this Ready Player One kind of uh, you know image that they've envisioned, but I know what kind of tools they're going to use to use the, to build the Vivi-verse. Um, you know, I build like things using game engines and, you know, all these different AR, VR APIs myself. I would say try not to try not to kind of overestimate what's possible with the technical constraints that we have as of today, just because then you're, it's going to feel kind of anticlimactic and you might feel underwhelmed when the experience comes because you can't, you know, um, walk around while sitting in your bed using something that's hooked up to your brain, you know, neurons and whatnot. It won't be, it will obviously won't, won't work like that. But it, I think the utility wise to OMI and whatnot, I think that's going to be huge. And it's nice to just have, you know, another platform that's not a mobile, somewhere that we can just kind of interact like we're doing on YouTube right now, just another platform where we can do that. Taps, you got something? Yeah, I mean, the Vverse is going to be really exciting. Just you see what's happened to so many tokens in the crypto space, just even and even the NFTs when they mention metaverse. And there's a big difference between different types of metaverses, right? Like there's going to be gaming platforms that have kind of metaverse elements. And then there's actually like true metaverses, like the big, big companies like Facebook and plenty of others are trying to build. But in, in, I'm seeing this question here. Do you think VV licensors agreements not only included collectibles, but real estate lands in the Vverse. I'm kind of split on this because I think it's, it may have been discussed if it was like a newer licensor, but maybe not so much if they had been like sitting on them for like, you know, 12 months, 18 months or so. Um, but also there's, it might potentially be a new agreement, right? Because I think of the VV first almost as like a separate product entirely from the VV app. And so I do think that there might be some that are baked in, but some not so much. But when you think about these metaverses that are building out like NFT platforms and crypto are needing to throw metaverse in there to stay relevant once, you know, everything kind of does cool down. And that's the way the space is going. So if you think about what's going to make or break a metaverse, think about the brands, think about the experiences that people are going to want to have. And then think about the IP that we have, like Disney and Marvel and all of the users, right? So actually, I'm going to share my screen again, if that's okay. Um, when you look at the top metaverse uh, coins, can I see it? Boom. When you look at the top meta metaverse coins, we're not even enlisted here. Like no one considers OMI a metaverse crypto because nothing's been seen yet. So you only know it's coming if you're in the know. But when you look at all these top metaverse coins, Mana, Sand, like, you know, they, they have metaverses that are active right now but they have a fraction of the users that we have. So people aren't just going to these things because they're trying to make as much money as possible. They're also looking for experiences, something to play, something to interact with. And we're gonna have that in spades with the top brand IP that we're also making tons of money with, right, with, with Vivi. So when it comes to where we're building and, and how vast it can be, it's gonna be rolled out in stages. And I think probably like sometime around like Q3 is when we'll see like the first iteration, like Kay said with like the Vivi City. but this space, like people want it now, right? But it's gonna be so, so big over the next couple of years. This is ARK Invest's um, thing that kind of shows like how big AR will scale in 23, 20, 2023, 2024 are where we start to see liftoff. That's gonna be like the prime years for VV to be building in the VVverse and the market cap the in the CAG around this is huge. So there's gonna be so much growth over the next couple of years, which is in line also with the next having a Bitcoin that Vivi is in a prime spot with 
the most users, the biggest brands, and it's going to just translate really well into a metaverse world that we're going to be one of the top players, in my opinion, not just in crypto, but also near some of the giants like what Facebook's and others are building into. I'm surprised that your thing doesn't crash with how many tabs you have open. <laughs> that's that's the research, man. Is like I always have. I've had like 50, 60 up before. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, for Sean, how do you think comics will play into the viewers? Um, I'm really excited about comics. I mean, I think specifically being able to rent the collectibles and having museums, specifically collectibles that are incredibly rare, low mint, net, mint numbers, or like I mentioned earlier, numbers that are connected specifically to the comic book itself. People are going to pay probably just to rent them out, you know, to rent them out, whether it's in a museum or at a show or an event or at a party. Uh, it's exciting, man. This whole metaverse, like, and there's probably a utility as well, like clubs for specifically the people who own Marvel Comics, one secret rare, things like that. Um, but man, being in that metaverse that has all of this IP is just a dream. I mean, literally, like being able to go to a Disney, uh, literally Disneyland virtually, you know, uh, um, man, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting. I, I always imagine, like, if you've seen Wreck-It Ralph 2, when Penelope goes to Disney.com, she sees, like, Marvel and Disney and Star Wars, you just, like, imagine, oh, it's exciting. But it's going to take time as, as far as what Kay mentioned earlier. You know, it's, it's don't, don't jump in and think it's going to be, like, Ready Player One. It's going to take time to get there, but you know, that, I definitely foresee that being the far, far future. But right now, it's, um, yeah, keep your expectations sound. But, man, it's, it's really, really exciting. Just a, just just a quick one, actually, um, because uh, I, I do some AR VR development myself. Uh, some stuff I'll show you guys later. But um, basically, what's really kind of uh, I guess been the rocket fuel recently is a lot of these massive companies like Niantic, for example. They very recently made their um, kind of I guess you could say like their AR VR technology open source, and that's what's really started to drive development and make things easier because um, AR VR development was absolutely janky as hell for like you know the past five years and um, Facebook they're kind of known for building tools and then making it open source um, they've built some of the best like industry grade frameworks on the market and they make it open source and now that they've kind of gotten into metaverses I believe they're going to make something that allows other projects to integrate their technology uh, geared specifically around metaverse development and that's going to really I think kind of supercharged the VVverse. Um, I know that recently Dan announced that the v, uh, VV app is going to feature occlusion and that's all based off of you know some upgrades that Google has done to their AR VR engine. Um, a lot of these components that VV uses you know they haven't like gone and built it themselves just because that's you know going to take a ridiculous amount of time but Google, Niantic etc they provide these tools to platforms like VV to integrate. So I think the more that we see these big companies like Facebook, Amazon etc make more of their tools open source which they're doing we're going to start to see much more rapid and much more streamlined development in metaverses including the vvverse so um, i think that's going to be a huge kind of turning point for us as well do you think the vvverse in 2022 is going to be a beta or do you think it's going to be a a pretty decent product out the gate oh it's going to be beta for sure yeah 100 <laughs> it's going to be a work in progress consistently yeah. I think it's important to remember too that like when it comes to building these kind of things like the viewers like this is not something you can do overnight or even in a month like this is a huge huge scalable project that will take quite a bit of time and i think the way we saw it during when was it k it was um uh right at which the comic-con right when they had that. yeah that was like that was like july time and that was like the, oh i did a video and it was the funniest like one of the yeah when you were jumping up i remember uh, yeah, trying to get I on, was the, map. on yeah. the roof i fell off the map i was walking around outside the map and i don't know if you guys remember but like when you go to the room you know there's like animal trophy heads they were like on the wall but if you go outside the room literally what the developers did is they took a 3d model of like a zebra and just literally rammed it like halfway through the wall to make it look like it was a trophy. I was laughing. I was like, was so this funny. is the most like rust, jankiest thing. Like, oh, it was funny. It was fun, but it was funny. Yeah. So I, that's why I just think that it's very important to remember that like this is going to take time. And I know a lot of people get mad about like VV, about like the timeline and stuff. But if they want to do it right and if they want to do it well, we should give them all the time in the world to do it right and do it well. And, um, Speaking of that, let's actually move on to another topic that uh, I think I'll have Gail, Chris, and Andy cover a little bit. Um, let's talk about utility. Let's see what you guys kind of think um, VV can implement in, in the VVverse or just in general. Um, Gail, you want to go first? What are your some tips on what you think the uh, utility that they can add? 
Well, uh, I think renting was already brought up. So the way I see this whole thing is that I think this is all the great part of the great wealth transfer. So how people are investing in the crypto and, you know, whatever, they're putting their fiat into the crypto that they trust that's going to, you know, help shape this society because we are transitioning from a, you know, digital to a digital society. So I think BB is playing a huge role in this great digital transfer. And they're taking all of the toys and the collections that we know and love, and they're just, you know, taking it over to the digital. You know, they're 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 uh, transferring all the all of the di- all of the comics that we know. I think all of the comics that we have on the BB app, that's all there's ever going to be. They're not going to make any reprints. So all of the Marvel Comics ones that we have, that's all there's ever going to be in NFT format. And when this when NFTs get widely mass adopted and the metaverses are, you know, mass adopted, I think this whole thing is just going to be. I think BB is going to be like the main metaverse. I know there's going to be multiple metaverses, but I think the NFTs that we're investing in now, they're going to be the ones. So renting NFTs are going to be huge, I think, because there's not there's not going to be enough to go around. So will people adopt comics? They definitely will. There's going to be people on BB right now who have comic shops. They're going to have hoverboard shops because we have all the we have all of the Back to the Future hoverboards currently on the app, and I'm sure they're going to make them drivable. You're not going to drop hoverboards on BB and not make them drivable. So there's going to be huge utility for the items that we know and love because these BB has the major brands, every all the brands that we already currently watch, you know, Marvel, Disney. I think I think BB is going to be the one. So there's going to be huge utility. Yeah, I, I hope that they bring maybe like South Park there so I can create my own little South Park character and like in the BB verse <laughs> and create my own little world there. But um, Andy, what about you? The utility thing always is, is mad to me about the stuff that they could add and have because as gail said you know we have the biggest brands in the world and we've saw stuff like movie tickets already with james bond and if you're thinking in terms of the vv verse and really when we built this out you're talking 20 25 and onwards you know you could have things like comic book clubs for certain people who own certain comic books people could get the premiere to the new spider-man movie if they own the, the spider-man nft you know, people could get invited to certain things that are happening within the VV verse if you own this, certain clubs, groups, things that do stuff, you know, there's just so much possibility with utility that I really do hope, and, and as we've said, you know, they're probably 20 times smarter than us and thought 500 steps ahead than what we usually do, so they, they have most likely thought about the utility that they can add to this, and I think it's just so exciting with the possibilities of things like premieres to movies for just owning an NFT, that makes something special of something. You know, being a part of a group, a part of a club that can have this purely by owning something on the VV app is just mind-blowing to me. Mind-blowing. Sean, Chris, you guys want to touch? Uh, each one of you, doesn't matter. Yeah, man. Yeah, um, I mean... Oh, sorry, Chris, go ahead. You can go for it, Sean. I'll, I'll go after you. I, I was just going to say, um, what's really exciting about these, these big IPs, especially... Is that they have the resources and power to make to add incredible real life utility to these collectibles, and especially I, I tweeted about this the other day about the the wall statue, that the kind of utility that could come to that. They could add utility whenever they want, Disney specifically. Um, I think the twelve month subscription is just the beginning potentially. I mean, we could be seeing, if, for example, these are just speculative, <laughs> but you're looking at possibly maybe a free ticket to Disneyland or free access to Disneyland worldwide. I mean, potentially even access to Club 33 at Disney. You know, who knows? But that kind of utility is going to be huge for the value of these collectibles. I mean, like, that's a big reason why Board Ape Yacht Club is, is so valuable because they have real life utility. Um, so when they add it to this, it's, these, these collectibles are just going to, yeah, it's going to moonshot, in my opinion. But yeah, so I think the cool thing is that obviously with the 007 ticket, we saw utility. And then, of course, with Disney, we saw that you could get Disney Plus, you know, three months or six months of Disney Plus with the utility. So that shows us that these major IPs understand NFTs and they understand utility. Uh, there is nothing in the future stopping them from dropping random utility to these said collectibles. Now, obviously, I don't want to say that on a live stream and get people hyped up and like, you know, hope that they can come. But the possibility is there. Like. And I come from a business background. And so I think, you know, there always has to be some sort of trade off. So like where these major companies making money, why would they want to give you these things? Well, with blockchain technology, that's where the beauty comes in. They make the money on the uh, on the secondary market. Every time one of these items are bought and sold again, if if you're new to VV, anytime something's bought and sold on the secondary market, part of it goes to the licensor. So the higher price items and the more that they're selling, the more money they make on the back end of things. So they add utility to 
X, Y, or Z and inflate the price and inflate the popularity, they're actually making money on that as well. Same potentially with like renting collectibles. So the utility is actually kind of crazy because I mean, they could literally, if they wanted to moonshot a collectible overnight and it could be random, it doesn't even have to be walled. It could, you know, it could very likely be walled. It could be, I, I guess all the gold moments would be a bad example because all of those are like amazing. But like, let's just say Elsa or something like that. Like they could have had some type of utility to Elsa and then boom, El Elsa's 2X, 3X overnight. And it kind of goes back to one of our first conversations on the stream is like, I guess like blue chips versus diversity. I mean, you never know what kind of utility can be added in the future that can increase the value of your set of collectibles. So for me, that makes me want to hold on to them just in case. A recent um, example of that we saw wasn't even a major IP. It was uh, Frank Kozik with the Labbits. Uh, I don't know if it's official or not, so I guess I don't want to talk on it too much. But basically, there, there's a possibility of being able to breed Labbits next year on, on Immutable X. Uh, so basically, if you own uh, two, two Labbits, you can put them together and then you know make a baby Labbit, which then you could sell that baby Labbit for passive income. Again, like if you're holding on to these random things and they add utility later in the road, you never know. So personally, I do come kind of from like a hoarder background, so it's hard for me to let go of things and I collect things so much. But also at the same time, like, I mean, that's pretty cool because... It could just be one of my random NFTs that I just happen to like and collect that could moon overnight just from the matting utility to it. So I think utility is a really good thing to keep in mind. And we, we don't have uh, this is the last thing I'm going to say before you know I mute my mic. Uh, I get this is speculation, and I guess this could be like a further question to you guys. But it does make me wonder if um, this utility does come into play. Say that you know you can have a Disney Golden Moment, and it gives you a percentage off of the Disney Park or whatever. If you rent that nft in the future do you rent that utility as well like like does the utility with the renting feature come with it and if so the possibility and the attractiveness to rent nfts at that point would be insane i'm going to disney next week i hear that sean has well sean probably has like 10 wallets you know <laughs> i hear that sean's got some wallets let me rent his own tea so i can get a 10 percent discount on my ticket you know like that'd just be like mind-blowing to me like the uh, how much that'd be used so uh, what are your thoughts on that uh gail you want to maybe touch on that a bit daniel yeah. Hey, Daniel, did you just have Gail's glasses? <laughs> Hold on, did he just? Where'd you get those? I want a pair. Gail, you got to start selling them as merchandise. Dude. I, 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 I did I know, a parody bro. a long time ago, and uh, I, I bought these for my little skit. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah that shout out to Dan awesome. for having those glasses. <laughs> but um, so we've been talking about utility on the major scale. There's also uh community utility. Like we can create the utility within ourselves too. Like we've seen it before. With uh, we got the with the Omicons and a, a few other groups, and even certain celebrities, they could they could pick a, a particular NFT. Let's say the Fumo Unicorno. They could say, okay, anybody who owns this gets a discount to one of my albums or something. There's so many random utilities that could be added to any given collectible. So the safest bet is just to collect what you like, and you know, hopefully, you might get lucky with uh, luck of the draw. But yeah, the utility is endless. There's so many possibilities that we probably can't even think of right now because of how technology and, you know, who knows what the future is going to hold. But, yeah, utility is going to be great. I don't think it, I don't know if anyone saw, but as soon as you mentioned breeding lab, it's K's eyes like lit up. <laughs> um, but, yeah, one of my favorite things that could be potentially as added as a utility is um, the ability that if you, like, land a drop, you could potentially meet the artist behind the drop if it's, like, an artist piece and stuff like that. I think that would be really, really cool because, like, We've seen um, already people posted up that they've met like Frank Kozik in real life and stuff. And I think like if you participate in his drop and stuff like that, you get the chance to meet him one day. And I think that's a really cool utility that they could potentially add. Um, anyone else have any other utility ideas that they can add? Well, especially if they can sign, right? So me and Sean were talking about this on our on our stream where digital signatures they've already confirmed will be coming eventually. And so it's a whole another added layer of value on top of your collectibles that can be enacted once that comes, right? So if they gave it to an event, having your Todd signed by Todd McFarlane or having your Labbits signed by Frank Kozak at Decon or Jermaine Rogers, like that's a whole nother level that they'll be able to authenticate and have that cert certificate on it, right? So that's even further utility, right? And what if it's like, I don't know, maybe you get some kind of collectible or award ribbon if you have it multiple signed at different events, things like that. So that's that whole side. I think will be a, a whole nother ball game when it comes to pricing out or collectibles. Yeah, one one interesting bit of utilities for another project I'm working on is um, we have well we will have NFTs which part of the metadata is a geolocation um, because these NFTs are tracked uh, essentially pegged to physical locations in the real world, and I think Vivi could do something like that as well, right? So hypothetically, let's say 
um, I don't know, they released a Spider-Man NFT. And as part of that Spider-Man NFT, part of the metadata is, um, you know, the location of one of the spots that they had filmed Spider-Man, you know, somewhere in uh, Queens or wherever, you know, Spider-Man is from. And if you are physically present in that location, any NFT with that, you know, as part of the metadata, with that geolocation part of it, if you're, let's say, within 10 mile radius, then you unlock something on that NFT. Maybe you unlock like an accessory or you unlock like, you know, um, some kind of special signature on it or something or some kind of coloration. Um, I think they can definitely do things like that. One idea that I had was, um, you know, you could get similar to something like, uh, it doesn't have to be like an egg, but like some form of capsule that's got a geolocation and you have to physically go to that location in order to open up the capsule and see what you get in it. Um, I think something like that would be quite good for companies looking to drive traffic to their physical events. Um, I think it's something that they could do for, you know, um, decon or something. Um, let's say on the market, they list 50,000 editions of a capsule. You know, it's really cheap. You buy one, but in order to open it, you have to physically go to, you know, one of these decon events within the next year. And that something could help drive traffic to decon events, for example. So I think geolocation is one that they could definitely utilize. And I definitely see that being used with other platforms, if not VV. Hey guys, I got to go. So real quick, I just want to say bye. Uh, Dan, Gibby, thank you for hosting this. Thank you for having me on. Gail, Ooh. Taps. Chris, it's been a pleasure. Hey, buddy. Happy, awesome, anniversary. Chris. happy anniversary to you, Chris. Thank you so much. Happy, yeah. anniversary. happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Yeah. Buddy. It is. Yeah, my wife actually allowed me to come up and, and do this for a couple hours <laughs> oh, before, awesome. before, before we go to an arcade and go watch Spider-Man for the first time. So yeah. let, let me know what you go. think of Spider-Man. I hope you enjoy I will, it. I will. Now, now that I publicly said that, I can't look at any social media because people are going to be trying to spoil it. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, take care, Chris. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks take for coming care, Chris. Up. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It's great talking with all of you. Peace out. So, so, so we're almost near the end here, guys. So let's cover maybe one final topic. And I think Taps, uh, Gail, Kay, and Daniel, you guys can cover this the best. Um. Let's talk a little bit about Omi and what we can kind of expect. I know Taps works on um, a bit of a timeline. Um, can you tell us a bit what goes into your timeline and how you kind of create it? Yeah, so I mean, I, I built a few roadmaps and timelines. And it's always been built off of the things that Ecomi and Vivi have said are coming and originally their timelines. But, you know, and, and the, obviously like all of our price predictions for 2021 did not work out, right? So I think a lot of what happened, you have to kind of take a back, a look back to six months ago and really think about what's happened for Omi specifically. Nothing for the most part, right? And like, that's no shot against Vivi or Ecomi. A ton has happened with Vivi. Ton, ton, ton. And like, that's the car. Omi's the, or yeah, that's, that's the car. That's the foundation, right? Omi's like the gas or the oil, however you want to word it. But really, like we've heard about exchanges, we heard about utility coming, we heard about all these things coming to Omi, but nothing's happened. So it's not really a surprise that the price has gone down and just kind of, you know, trickled along. But all that's now ahead of us with the move to Immutable Blacks. And I think a lot of the price or the delays in that was because of the delay, like Kay talked about how there's been a lot of delays for Immutable X itself as a platform, and now they're getting up to speed. So, but Ecomi and Vivi aren't really going to come out and say, hey, our, our partner that we're moving to is having delays. So I think that's why there's been not that that big vertical lift that we've seen. But when you look back to the, the huge price jump that we had back in March, it was built around Uniswap. Like that was the big, like everyone's catching on, but there was huge vertical jumps because of the Uniswap announcement and then leading up to the listing. And then when it came out with Womi and all that, and there was just really no other Omi things happening after that, we saw it really, really go down. So they announced that we're going to be seeing two or three more exchanges back in, I think it was July. And we didn't see them because of the move to Mutable X. So those are still on the docket. And when you look at other like uh, platforms, you look at like Terra Virtua, they're on Ethereum and they have Binance, they have KuCoin, all of these, but they also have Bitforex and Gate.io. So I'm kind of thinking about what other platforms are similar that makes sense to also go to other exchanges, as well as what were compatible with GoChain back in July, which GoChain is compatible with Binance and KuCoin. So I think we'll see a number of exchanges coming this year that will have vertical lift on the OMI token, as well as, like you guys said, all the utility coming in. And it'll be, you know, a, a much better year for OMI versus the last part of this year that we've seen. Yeah, before we get to uh, Andy, I kind of wanted to ask Kay a specific question. Um, I noticed that a lot of the times when it comes to like the like Bitcoin going down or Ethereum going down, 
it, it, I noticed that Omi, for some strange reason, always moves slightly differently. Do you think that that's something that will always be happening? Where, like, if we do enter that bear market and stuff, that Omi will move separately? Is he is he frozen? Yeah, I, I think he's frozen, or is it me that's frozen? No, it's I think it's K. Yeah, and frozen, maybe frozen. maybe you want to cover yeah, this yeah. while we get K back. <laughs> Sorry, what was the, who, um, who so was... I'm just asking, like, um, I noticed me personally for the last uh, uh, six months or so that I've been involved in OMI and BB, I've noticed that when Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all these other coins kind of go down, OMI moves on its own. So I'm wondering, do you think that that kind of continues on and that OMI will always kind of be on its own trajectory and its own path? And do you think that maybe the overall crypto market does affect it as well? Daniel, do you want to go? I'm I'm not sure. I'm a market analysis, so I'm yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll get you know, K after that because I think he's back. But uh, okay. Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, when you look at how many OMI tokens are in the hands of just a few whales, I mean, there's really, I would say, the whales own the vast majority of OMI tokens right now. And I think as time goes on, as they start taking profits, and as you know, we start buying their tokens. I think this effect will be lessened over time. And as we get into these major exchanges, especially the big ones like Coinbase, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the big ones, KuCoin, whatever, we'll start to see that their effect on the token will be lessened over time. And I think you'll start to see it more in line with altcoins generally moving in, in one direction and occasionally kind of doing its own thing with big announcements. So that, that's just my piece on that. And Kay, you can, you can follow up with that if you want. Yeah, sure. Uh, you guys can hear me now, right? Yep. yep. Awesome. Yeah, you back. yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. So basically my thoughts. So um, I recently put out a prediction yesterday. Uh, Daniel Lee uh, reacted to it in Daniel Lee fashion. <laughs> so my prediction, you know, was for the end of this year was supposed to be one cent. Um, but that was, you know, with the caveat that we do get the IMX migration this year for OMI token. Um, but you know, uh, that got pushed forward, which for very good reason, you know, people don't want to be dealing with that, right, you know, during Christmas, things don't do go wrong. Um, so yeah, my prediction is, you know, about one cent when that does happen. And for the upcoming next year, I believe um, it's two cents. And a lot of people, they kind of were a bit shocked by it. They felt that was, you know, quite underwhelming. But, you know, um, it, the way that I kind of explain it is like running through a field, and then running into mud, right? Um, up until that point of like getting to two cents with the IMX, you know, with the new exchanges, etc. It's going to be kind of like running through a field, and then you get into running through mud where you slow down massively. And what the mud is is we're finally going to reach that price level where a lot of these whales are going to start taking profit. And you know, this in many projects that I'm in would be speculation, but you know, some of us in our room, we know a lot of these whales, you know, and when I say whales, I mean, not people that own, you know, 20, 30 million OMI or a hundred million, like, you know, some of these guys own 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion. And they, they've just been, you know, they, they believe in the project. They haven't been dumping or anything. They've just been sat there. And it's finally going to get to a point where they're going to probably take small amounts of profit. You know, we're not going to feel it. The price won't, uh, you know, it's not going to like, it shouldn't dump. Um, but it's not going to rock it up like we think it is. It's going to be like slow and steady. And so I think we're going to kind of creep towards two cent by the end of next year, uh, which I think is still amazing. You know, that's a free X from where we are right now. And most, you know, assets, when they go free X in a year, that's considered absolutely ridiculous. So I think, you know, OMI will get to where it's supposed to go, but it's not going to be like what people think it is, like a, you know, a rocket ship. It's going to be, you know, nice and steady. And we'll see that kind of go as with new announcements. Now, that being said, um, if it goes higher, then, you know, even better. And there is potential for it to go higher just because we don't know to what degree they're going to be releasing vv branded ip and how the land is going to work etc and i think that's going to have the biggest impact on burning omi um so yeah we'll just have to see uh just one other thing i like collecting iron man so i i want to show you guys like i've got the gingerbread iron man uh this is like a christmas <laughs> one and then i've got like um this special edition like a uh, neon one as well like i've got no room for physical that's awesome but, uh, yeah i i just like <laughs> <laughs> i just keep buying these I've got so many different variants where's your bridal pikachu Oh, oh, wait, hold on. You still uh, have it. Oh no, I've got I've got I've got I've got the chef one here. Yeah. <laughs> that's is that the one you did with Reese when you kind of creeped yeah, it up? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I've got like the really like huge one. That's like yeah. 
massive. But that, that one's not mine. That's my girlfriend's. I'm just holding it for her because she has no room. I'd love to get an NFT or something of like the Gale and the glasses and stuff. I think that'd be freaking awesome. Oh yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Um. Okay. One. While we're still kind of on the topic of uh, Omi, before we jump into the resources that we can all share, do you? I think a lot of people. I'm still learning. I'm still kind of new to crypto and still learning. But I think a lot of people underestimate that if Omi gets to the five cents, you got to calculate what the market cap will be at that point. And the market cap is extremely important to understanding where the price will go and how high it'll go because as the price jumps the market cap increases and if you're kind of saying that it's going to reach 10 cents then what's the market cap worth at that time because then it becomes um, like a top 10 coin in a sense right so yeah yeah um so the thing with omi right is market cap becomes less relevant because of the deflationary aspect of it so it's right now okay so um, you know, many people know by now there were some people kind of, you know, with huge bags of Omi kind of playing around back in, you know, April with the price. And, you know, I don't know what's been going on, but, um, you know, the price being suppressed of Omi, that with Omi burning is kind of been good in a way. It's allowed many people to accumulate more, but it's also demonstrated that market cap for OMI is not as important as it would be for other non-deflationary cryptos. So really, it becomes a bit of a race, like how much OMI can we truly realistically burn before we see true mainstream adoption? If we can burn as much as we can now, um, and if they do VVverse and land before OMI goes truly mainstream and we just burn a crazy amount, then when it comes to, you know, the rate of OMI burn decreasing because the price has gone higher, at that point, market cap would matter more. But at this point, I think market cap is not really uh, a you know, significant factor. And hypothetically, we could actually stay at the exact market cap we are at as of today and still be at five cents. That's, you know, assuming we burn enough OMI, which I don't think we'll do at this point. But we're going to start to see kind of this closing gap between the relevance of market cap and the price of OMI. I think we'll probably, you know, we may need to get to 10 to 12 billion to see, you know, potentially three, four cents, uh, even five cents if we burn enough. Um, but that's my view on it. And Thanks. one thing that is very, very insightful. Go ahead, Taps. Sorry, one thing to just add to that too is everyone always thinks of market cap as if we're going to be in that ranking where it is right now all the time. Because Right now, if you had it at what five cents, it would be a top 20 or, or, or whatever market cap crypto. But those current top 20s will also move up and down as Bitcoin and Ethereum and all the other move up as well. So as our market cap goes up, so will those other market caps, right? So, you know, it could be a top 20 if it were to shoot up tomorrow. But if it shoots up in, you know, six months, a year, two years, whatever, those others will also be higher market caps. But like, as Kay said, that is the other side that people don't think about is the fact that it is a deflationary token. So as we burn more, that market cap is getting, well, the, the price of market cap is getting smaller. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so we can kind of go towards the end. I was just thinking we all share the resources that we use to inform everyone. And then we um, take a couple of questions. Is there anything that you guys think that we may have missed? Anything that the Gail, Sean, Andy, anything that you guys want to cover that we may have missed? Gail? Um, no, I just want to add to, um, you know, if you're not already following, you know, the official VB page or the Call Me Twitter page, you should do that because I get a lot of questions that could be answered if you just simply follow that page. So go ahead and make a Twitter, if only just for that. You know, you want to stay in tune with your investment. And on the same page with Twitter, they have this thing called Twitter Spaces where you can hop in this room uh, where you can listen to people from the VV community speak. And I've been in there like almost like at least three hours a day minimum lately. And I'm I'm learning like 10 times as much as, as I would if I was just watching TV. So you definitely want to listen to these, listen to the people in the community talk because you're going to learn so much. You're going to fast track your, your VV experience. You're going to learn about the marketplace. You're going to hear some ideas that you never would have thought of on your own. So just stay in tune with the community. Watch watch YouTubers like myself and everybody on on screen here. You're gonna you're gonna fast track your learning. You're gonna learn from our mistakes and you know just stay in tune with information that you can learn from others. Yeah, one of the main resources that I'll share before I let you guys share yours is YouTube. Everyone that's up here right now has their own knowledge in a specific portion of something related to VV or OMI. And they're all very, very resourceful. Like everyone here is so knowledgeable in the space that if you really, really want to be in tune, just pay attention to when they post, put, uh, uh, add the notifications, the bell, whenever they post, because 
Taps, Kay, Daniel, Sean, Andy, Gail, you guys post some incredible content. And when I first started off with my VV journey, I paid attention very heavily to your YouTube videos to kind of understand what was happening. And it's a really, really great learning source. And there's a lot of websites, but one of the best ones to kind of use as a resource is YouTube. So if you're not subscribed to any of these people right now, if you're not following them on Twitter, this is probably one of the best resources that you could have because their knowledge is, you can't find it anywhere else. And these guys are awesome. Kind of the reason that we put this panel together. Um, but now let's uh, continue. Taps, do you want to share any resources that the uh, community can share? Yeah, I mean, I, I showed at the beginning of this video in case some hopped in here a little bit late, but Ecomi Wiki is one of the ones that I use the most. I know uh, Rebel Duck has some analytics stuff as well and uh, Cherry Charts. Like if anything that you can do to step your game up on how you're actually buying, selling and trading your collectibles in the app, use use the analytics, right? Like that's how day traders use with stocks and everything like that. Like it just makes sense to kind of use it as your benefit. And with Ecomi Wiki, I mean, like I, I like I said, I, I log in every single day just to see what's up and what's down and then make decisions based off that. So, you know, just like everyone said, like you can learn from us, you can learn from others, hop in Twitter spaces and, and have those conversations about what will determine value. But if you're just, you know, looking for like a quick analytical mind on what to buy and sell, use those those resources because they are really effective. Andy, do you have any resources you'd like to share? Yes, another one, uh, Butt Thompson's spreadsheet. Uh, his is incredible. I, I can send the link in our, our chat right here. Um, but he has a page where you can see all of the collectibles listed just in an Excel spreadsheet and then prices point price points at different days. I think he does it every is every three days, every four days. Um, where he does the new prices of it, you can calculate your your vault um based on the the price at the moment. I, I've always loved his stuff. He was like the original, him and Rebel Duck were the originals who created those spreadsheets. So definitely one to check out as well when you're looking at um, historical prices, because I know Ecomi Wiki can only go back to, I believe, October the 16th, if I'm not mistaken, or round about that area. Um, if you're looking for further back when it's the likes of the Spider-Man drop on August the 7th or in that region, then you're going to be able to get the information based on the prices for there for historical data anyway. Awesome, awesome. And before we get to Sean, Kay, do you have any, you're a pretty resourceful guy as well. Do you have any resources that you'd like to share? Um, I would say I would say some of the best resources are probably, um, you know, the ones where you can interact with people. So the official VV Discord, um, you know, every every day before, um, you know, like an hour and a half before the drop, an hour before the drop, um, the VV Discord mods, they open up the stage. You can join in, ask questions, get involved in conversation. That's a good one. Uh, Twitter Spaces is really good. So, um, you know, like, uh, Lenny, Skeet, um, you know, some of these guys, they always uh, host Twitter spaces so you can get involved and just, uh, you know, get involved in the conversations they have. Um, Sanjay's always in there as well. Um, and outside of online stuff, so a bit more unconventional, um, but, you know, if you like really want to take it far, um, I would say definitely attend, you know, like NFT slash blockchain based events just because you learn like so much from um, just being in that environment and seeing what other projects are doing. And I, I can tell you guys now, the NFT space, because it's such a small nascent space, right? Like crypto is small, but NFT is like a tiny section of that. The people within NFTs kind of all know each other. And from there, you know, um, you basically probably, you know, meet people who work with Ecomi. Like I've met people who work with Ecomi actively right now. Um, and from there, you get to learn more about, you know, like, the challenges involved in a project, like kind of, you know, the aspirations, ambitions. So, you know, these events, they happen like Decon, other conventions, you can just, you know, buy a ticket, turn up and just talk to people at these events. So that's if you want to like kind of do something more like in person rather than online. But those are kind of like, you know, the two main kind of things that have helped me like heavily the past year. Yeah. And I think, I think that Daniel will probably share all the links to all these resources in the comments uh, below in the tag. Um, but now I think probably people's most important one that people would really like to know, Sean, what you got for us? You know, I started the podcast in August. I've been around since April and I started watching all you guys' YouTube channels. So I'm a huge fan of all you guys. I still watch your videos all the time. So just to let you all know, like they, they have incredible content. And the majority of stuff I know today is from, from all y'all. So thank you for that. And um, for, for comics specifically, I would say two, there's two really good websites. One is Go Collect. And Go Collect is basically a, a website where you can go and learn the physical value of these comic books, specifically graded comic books. It takes resources like Heritage Auction and eBay, 
and Comic Link, and it takes the sales and it tracks them on the website. So you're able to track past sales and determine the value in its physical grade. And I, I fully anticipate this stuff happening for uh, the NFTs as well. But also, uh, keycollectorscomic.com. This website tells you basically what the comic is about. Are there any significant first appearances? Is it a first edition of its series? All the information about the comic itself. So between the two, you're pretty golden. We also released a video recently called um, Key Grails and Spec Books and why they're important and why you need to know about them. So take, definitely take a look at it on our YouTube channel um, and hit me, hit me up if you have any questions. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Daniel, do you have anything to share? Yeah, um, I think it's always good to go on uh, Telegram. Uh, occasionally, Reese pops up on the official Ecomi to Telegram. Drop some gems every now and then. Sometimes you can ask them questions directly, and to me, that's the easiest way to get a hold of some of those team members. Sometimes, but then, so yeah, just another thought. Have um, uh, Sleepin's website that they can kind of post up to the chat. Uh, does anyone have? Uh, I think that's a really VV Ranks dot com and big big shout out to Sleepin Comics. Amazing guy, wonderful insight in the space, and his website's really really cool. So yeah, I've used, it a, I've used it a couple of times. Yeah, it's awesome. very, very detailed and stuff. Um, uh, the resources that I could share is um, I learned from all of you guys, but yesterday I hosted a space on my Twitter that was recorded, and we I had uh, a couple CPAs come up where we talked about everything related to NFTs, taxes, and crypto. Um, so if you are looking to understand how VV, like the implementation of taxes, you can go on my Twitter, give me on VD, and you can kind of tune into that recorded space that we had about taxes. Because I think people neglect to know that that's one of the most important things when it comes to investing. You have to understand how taxes work, whether you're the UK, yeah. whether it doesn't matter where you are, you will be taxed on this kind of stuff. So it's very important to know. So if you do go on my Twitter, I'll have it pinned up and you can kind of listen. It's about an hour or two conversation, but it, it's very, very informative for you to understand from professionals how they look at taxes when it comes to NFTs and stuff like that. But um, I think now we can kind of go get a couple questions. If you guys still have time, we can take some questions from the audience. Yeah, a, a, uh, I got one more resource. So if you if if you have another resource is the watch Ready Player One. If you haven't seen Ready Player One, that's going to give you a great idea of what we see when we when it comes to these NFTs. Just the possibility, you know, of NFTs at its maximum potential. I know David Yu has said many times that Ready Player One is their end game. So don't expect that when the BBverse comes out right away. But you know, to have some foresight with this, you gotta have some foresight when you're buying these NFTs. If you haven't seen Ready Player One, watch that. There's a few other movies, but Ready Player One is like the most popular one. Awesome, awesome. Um, are you, do you guys still have time for just a few questions? I know we've been out here for like two hours, but um, I, I, I actually kinda... need to head off. Um, I'm really sorry that I need to head early, but I just want to say before I head, this has been incredible. Like. As Sean said, I'm a fanboy of a lot of your <laughs> your content. So being able to be on here and chat with you has just been incredible. And Gabby, massive respect for you setting this up and, and getting us all together to talk. I really think this could be a good resource. But I hope you all have an incredible rest of your night. And thank you so much for You're having so me. Awesome. Happy, you. You're so awesome. Happy New Year, Andy. Andy. Thanks so much for coming. Andy. Andy. See you, Andy. Yeah, so we're kind of at the end here, guys. Do you guys have maybe five minutes or so that we could take some questions from the audience? Daniel, you could pull them up whenever you get a chance. Okay, guys, if you have some questions, I know there's been a couple, but if you have something, now's your time. Shoot them. Shout out to whoever just bought my lab. It. I've seen that comment. <laughs> Frankie oh, Boy says... I see, um, the lab it floor, it's like during the stream, it's just been going up. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. In the last few days, the lab it price has gone up 45% on the elf ones. It was 45 gems two days ago, and now it's like 65 Okay, people like, are going to think you're, you're you're manipulating the market. Yeah, no, they're gonna, yeah no, that's exactly they're gonna be like. This guy, he manipulates the market. He's got like it's, a billion rabbits. He's going to dump them, et cetera. What's et cetera. funny is he said later in 2022 too. So like, yeah, don't, man. don't ape in at these highs. Like everyone yeah. will kind of forget about it for a little bit. He'll stop tweeting for a little bit. And that's when you stock up on your rabbits and, and sit on them for a while. Uh, Gail, you want to answer this question right here? I think that's a perfect question for you. Uh, I think you might be. Am I muted? Is he muted? No. Oh no. I was just reading it. Um. So it's just asking what what is better, low mint or high mint? Yeah. Well, I would say low mint, obviously, because you know people people want to find a way to differentiate these NFTs, and unlike OpenSea NFTs, you know those NFTs has properties, so it's it's clear what what is rare. But when it comes to BB NFTs, they all look the same, right? 
So the one of the few ways to tell the difference is the mint number. And, you know, more often than not, people are going to choose a lower mint than a higher mint to add more value to it. So low mint for sure. Low mint also gives you more MCP points as well. So that's another one. Yeah. Yeah. Amy asked, yeah. Amy asked yeah, when is yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, oh, no, go, uh, I was just going to say, um, yeah, low mints definitely matter. Uh, they, they're already selling for a premium. Uh, it's interesting, actually. Spencer, uh, my co-host of the podcast, he actually told me from the very beginning, focus on the top, or we call it the top 5%, but really it's the, like the bottom 5% of the entire collection. Always focus on the bottom 5% of the entire collection. And then sure enough, in the MCP, it came out recently that you get additional points, 50% more points, if you have the top 5% mint numbers. So if you have a secret rare that's in the top or bottom, bottom, I keep, <laughs> bottom 5% of the collection, and you get 50% more points. So that six points is now nine points. So it's really important to think about that. But also we, we were talking about how the last mint member, and actually it's really cool because David, you brought this up recently. Um, the, the very last, he always feels the very last mint number is going to be worth a lot. It's very it's considered very valuable. So on our, on our CGC mint number grading scale, we actually put 90, at the very bottom, we put 99.9% .9 for that reason, because we also feel the same, uh, that high, high mint numbers. I don't know, we still don't know what to, to its degree. Uh, like which numbers, where is it going to stop, right? The value um, for the, the very highest mints. But the very last mint number for sure, and possibly the last few, are going to do very, very well long term. Awesome. Uh, Taps, any uh, update on that question that we got up there on screen? I think you could cover that one. Which is expect, or when is expected launch of Eververse? So they said, I think in an AMA back in like October, that they were six months away from seeing the first iteration and they could have been referring to like an article or just like the VVCD. city i think that's a little bit too soon like we know timelines have been pushed out quite a bit um so if, if that timeline is accurate that would put us sometime around april which again that sounds a little bit too early so maybe the first iteration that we could see would be like the like q3 of next year which would be probably what july um and again it'll be rolled out in phases so that won't be right away, you know, being able to buy land, but having like a home or some of the show and then having BB city and things like that rolled out. So I think we'll see it rolled out in the back half of 2022, but they did update the site to show it used to say 2021. So it was pushed out and now it says 2022. So, uh, they're, they're working on it, but again, that's kind of my speculation on timeline. Yeah. Okay, guys, I think this is a good spot to kind of end it. Um, I want to thank all of you guys for kind of coming in here and helping out. Um, I wanted to do this right before the end of the year so people who are new to VV can kind of get a little bit informed about what's going on. Is there anything else you guys would like to add before we end this? Kay, Sean, Gail, anybody? And, and anything else to add? Uh, my only advice is don't FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> That's good advice. Uh, but yeah, it's if yeah. Research, yes. My my number research one advice is do your own research. Don't follow an internet personality. Don't fall into the FOMO trap. Don't chase the hype. Do your own research. Collect what you like, and you'll be successful. And find your own voice when you invest. Find your own voice. Figure out what you want to invest in and why, you know, and you'll figure it out. And it's it's a lot of fun. That's when it gets really fun when you start to understand what you're investing in and not just listening to other people. We will, we love to give advice and give our opinions, but at the end of the day, you got to put the research in. You got to know what you're investing in. And it's gonna it's gonna help out long term. It's gonna yeah. yeah. And remember, guys, we're we're early. Like have have some fun when you do this kind of stuff. Like it it shouldn't be a chore. It shouldn't be. It, have fun. Enjoy it. Gail taps. Any any last final words? Yeah. Um. Trust your instincts. You know. Collect what you like. And you know, there might be a hundred people going right, but you know, you might feel like going left is the correct way. You know. Sometimes you gotta trust yourself, and you know, sometimes you're gonna be right. You know, a hundred people might be wrong. Don't. Don't just think because of the masses are thinking one way that you're automatically wrong. So trust your instincts. And at the same time, uh, take responsibility for your investment. Nobody's nobody's forcing you to press that buy now button. So consider all of the factors when you're pressing that buy now, buy now button. You know, why am I doing this? Is, is this my thoughts or is it somebody else's thoughts? And yeah, other than that, have fun. And it's an awesome investment, in my opinion. Yeah. And there's a lot of new users coming in every single day. So I'm always kind of, kind of reminding people like, do not be afraid to ask questions, right? Like there's been great questions in here. They're like, hey, what does IMX stand for? What does you know, MCP stand for? What does MTL stand for? So, you know, a lot of us speak because we've been doing this for quite some time covering VV since, you know, earlier this year. 
but there's every single day new users coming in who don't understand the lingo or don't understand, you know, some of the like why an addition number is going to be selling higher if it's lower. So if you're unsure on something, hop in the hop on Twitter, hop on the Discord, hop on some of these resources we shared, and do not be afraid to ask questions because at the end of the day, like this is an investment. This is something that we're building. We're part of a community. So again, just interact with us and everyone else and you'll be successful. Awesome. So uh, Daniel, I think we could close it off. I just want to say happy new year's to you guys. Thank you so much for coming out here. I think this was very informative for a lot of people. I hope everybody enjoyed this. Um, Daniel, any final closing words and then you can close it off. Well, I just, just want to thank you, Gibby, for arranging all this. This was really your labor, getting all of us together pretty quickly in less than a week. So I actually had a lot of good to uh, times with you guys, and I think there's a lot of good information. So I appreciate Gibby, appreciate each and every one of you, Gail, Sean, Taps, Hello K, Andrew, everyone else that came on. Appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all for having us. Yeah, I'll see you guys yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good we'll end the stream here. Thank you guys. Take care. Have a good new year. Happy new year, guys. Take care. Happy new year, guys. Happy new year. Peace.